Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the uh, Wallingford Planning and Zoning Commission to order. This is our Monday, November 14th, 2022 meeting. Well, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And at this point in time, I'd like to introduce the members of the uh, commission and staff that are here this evening. To my far right is uh, Jamie Hine, who's an alternate on the commission. Next to Jamie is Jeff Cohan, a commission member. And to my immediate right is uh, Jim, James Fitzsimmons, also a uh, member of the commission. To my immediate left is J.P. Vinoit, who is the uh, vice chairperson of the commission. And next to J.P. is Steve Allenson. And at the lower table, on our staff, uh, staff table is uh, Cheryl Ann Tubby, who's our recording secretary. And next to Cheryl Ann is Kevin Pagini, who's our town planner. And I'm Jim Seichter. I'm the uh, chairperson of the, uh, of the commission. And our first, uh, as we don't have any minutes on our agenda to approve, I'll make just one announcement as far as one item that's not going to be heard this evening at the request of the applicant. Uh, it's the site plan for a warehouse for Mark Development LLC at 1107 Northrop Road. Again, no action has been requested on that by the, uh, by the applicant. And before I go to the first item on our agenda, uh, I want to drop down to uh, the new business. Is uh, Stephen and Judith uh, Van uh, Blarkham, if I'm pronouncing the name? If you're, okay, well, because that's an accessory apartment. Uh, sir, if you'd come forward and... Uh, Begin your presentation. Introduce yourself and uh, begin your presentation. Oh, you stand, sit. Probably be more comfortable if you sat. And it, it makes it, it probably better to do to sit because then we can pick you up on a microphone. So if you would please just make sure that the microphone is close to you so they can pick you up. So again, introduce yourself and your Hi, presentation. I'm Carmen Gianni. I'm a partner of Thomas Gianni and Sons, which is a building contractor. Steve and Judy Van Blockham are my customer and also a friend. Uh, we're looking to turn their existing house into mixed use, I guess it would be called. We want to put, they make the kitchen into a, uh, the garage into a kitchen and a laundry room and the existing bathroom, we want to add a shower. And that's pretty much it. Just so when you say mixed use, you mean accessory apartment, is that correct? What I you're guess looking what, to what's happening is Steve and Judy's living downstairs and their grandson and wife are living upstairs. Um, most of the basement is already finished. It's been finished for years. We so just again, need it's a, to. Yeah, so it would be an accessory apartment. Rather I guess, than when, I yeah, guess rather, it would. Because when you said mixed use, I'm, I, I think we're all looking at that's that. That's what they told me it would be when we went for a permit. Is They told me it would be mixed use. I don't, we don't know why or what, you know. Well, that's probably one of the mysteries of life. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's actually kind of like a mother-in-law apartment, but it's really yeah, it's, not. Not. Would 100%. be an accessory apartment, but no. Uh, commission members, any questions for the applicant? Mr. Allenson. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> jumped ahead of myself. I'm getting so excited here. Uh, Mr. Allenson, please note all correspondence for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we have an interdepartmental referral from our fire marshal, an interdepartmental referral from our registered sanitarian, received October 17th, 2022. Uh, the fire marshal's de departmental referral was received October 14th, 2022. Excuse me. I'm also getting ahead of myself. We have an interdepartmental referral from our town engineer, date of receipt October 12th, 2022. And an interdepartmental referral from uh, Scott Shipman, water and sewer, received November 2nd, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Allenson. And again, seeing no commission members had any questions. Mr. Pagini, any comments on the application? Uh, no comments. Thank you. I take it that's the extent of your presentation? That's it. <laughs> we haven't voted on the application oh, yeah, yet. I don't know. All right, thanks. <laughs> I know you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Uh, at this point in time, there's uh, no further uh, questions from any, uh, any commission members. The applicant's finished its presentation. I'd entertain a motion on the application. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve site plan Van Blarkham 8 Fawn Drive application 223-22. Site plan request for a 450 
square foot accessory apartment located at 8 Fawn Drive, subject to one, comments in the inter office memorandum from junior engineer Scott Shipman to the Planning and Zoning Department dated November 2nd, 20, uh, 2022. Two, comments of the Health Department and Interdepartmental Referral dated uh, October 14th, 2022. And three, final inspection by the Zoning Enforcement Officer. I have a motion on the application. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohan. Yes. 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 And yes. Now the application has been approved. Have a good evening. Yes, you are. Have a good Thank evening, sir. Good. Okay, jumping up now to the uh, first item on our agenda, which is continuation of a public hearings, the zoning text and map amendment for section 4.23, incentive housing overlay district, section 4.23, section 4.23E to create a new subdivision to increase unit density allowances for affordable units to 50 units an acre. And Mr. Allison, would you please note all additional correspondence for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a zoning text amendment, section 4.23, incentive housing zone, consisting of one, two, three, four, five, six pages and a map. Thank you, Mr. Allison. And again, as this is the uh, commission's uh, text amendment, Mr. Pagini, again, this is a continuation of the public hearing, but if you would just for people who may not be familiar with it, just give everyone an overview of exactly what this is. Uh, this creates a <laughs> sub-district uh, that we're referring to as the de downtown development corridor um, down in the incentive housing overlay zone. It'll consist of 7.2 acres. Um, the text amendment was discussed at the last meeting, um, and we did want to just make it consistent with the town center zone, um, so we we looked at changing the remainder of the other sub-districts that may overlap the town center to provide uh, for higher acreage uh, units per acre in those areas. Um, and the overall creation of this sub-district is to allow for 50 units an acre within that downtown development corridor. And also, it also adds uh, residential amenities to the, the first floor. Um, as an allowed use in the incentive housing zone. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, I don't know if you want to continue discussion on this one. I know the, uh, we had some commission members at our last month's meeting were not, uh, were not here. So I would open up to you know, commission members. We discussed this uh, last month. Uh, any commission members like to make any, uh, you know, any further comments on this? Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I was unable to attend last month, but uh, I uh, do support these changes to the in incentive housing zone. Um, specifically, uh, this is something we've talked about at numerous meetings and uh, the ability for us to provide different housing zone um, opportunities in town is, is important. So I'm in favor of the, the recommended change that we've discussed for months. Thank you, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Any other commission members? This is a public hearing. Any members of the uh, public would like to come and uh, comment on the, uh, this particular uh, application, please come forward and name an address. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Jim Wolf, a, a member of the Economic Development Commission. Uh, at our Monday's meeting last Monday, we did discuss just what you had uh, on the table from last month, and everybody in the economic development uh, was in favor of supporting what you have before you. So we, we are in favor and we do support it. Thank Good. you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Seeing no one else would like to comment on it, I'd ask any, uh, any final comments from uh, commission members? Again, I would just... Uh, Make a comment that I'm certainly in favor of this. As Mr. Fitzsimmons pointed out, we've had this incentive housing zone uh, on the books for quite some time. We really have not seen any development in that uh, in that area, uh, as well as uh, in our downtown quarter. So we've decided to uh, look to increase the density. At the present time, in this particular area, the density would be uh, 
26, depending upon the acre, is 26 to 30 units uh, per acre. And uh, again, we as mentioned we haven't seen uh, any development in here, so we were uh, looking at this to uh, try to create some uh, additional incentive to see some some development in this particular area. So certainly from my perspective, I'm in full support of the increase. Seeing that there's no further comments from the public, uh, at this point in time, I'd entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we close the public hearing for application 904-22, zoning text and map amendment to section 4.23, incentive housing overlay district section 4.23 and 4.23.E to create a new sub-district to increase unit density allowances for affordable units to 50 units an acre. And we have a, uh, we have a motion to close the public hearing. Do we have a, uh, do we have a second? second? Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I entertain a motion on the application. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the zoning text amendment and map amendment for application for 904-22, a zoning regulation text and map amendment to section 4.23, instead of housing overlay district section 4.23.D and 4.23.E to create a new sub-district to increase the unit density allowances for affordable units to 50 units an acre and to allow first floor accessory residential amenities because it will allow for more opportunities to develop within our regulations. We have a motion on the application. Do we have a second? Aye. Second by Mr. Simmons. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohan. Yes. 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 And yes, the application has been approved. Moving on. Item number two, which is zoning text uh, and map amendment for section 4.26 town center, section 4.26 B15, to create a new sub-district to increase unit density allowances to market rate units to 40 units per acre. And again, Mr. Allison, please note all additional comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have the uh, zoning text amendment, which consists of one page and a map. Good. Thank you, Mr. Allison. And again, Mr. Pagini. So this is a uh, similar to the last one. Uh, it's the same general area, but it would allow for market rate uh, allowances for 40 units per acre. Uh, the, the changes that came out of the last meeting was again consistency with the incentive housing zone. Um, so it was uh, concurred with corporation council um, whether or not to, um, which, which way to go with that. And it was uh, decided that uh, the, the units that would, that are currently required to be accessible in the town center, uh, we would remove that. We would still encourage accessibility, but we would allow um, just first floor apartments provided they are not located on the ground level street facing area of the building, uh, much as like the incentive housing zone allows. Um, as I said, accessible features would always be encouraged, um, but it was expressed that there should be consistency with the incentive housing zone. Um, also, the, some of the other changes, uh, I think we, we're going to have a parking discussion, but I don't know if we want to go down that road uh, tonight, um, but I think it was discussed at the prior meeting to potentially um, decrease minimum parking requirements uh, due to the changes in density uh, that we're looking to do, maybe just in that one specific area. Uh, so I think it may be something we should workshop in the coming months uh, to potentially look at that. And I know you had brought up the, the new uses. I don't know if you want me to get into that yet or wait until we discuss the... I think it would be better if we... Uh, first of all, just getting back to the, uh, the parking, I think it would be more beneficial, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, to have some, uh, you know, some suggestions as far as what we uh, what we might look at as far as, you know, reducing the parking. Uh, mm -hmm. If again the commission's inclined to do that, some suggestions on that. And I think at that particular point in time it would also be appropriate then to talk about perhaps some additional uses. So, at this point in time, unless other commission members disagree, I think let's just simply focus on what we have here. Everyone agree with that? Okay, good. 
That being the case, I take it, Mr. Pagini, that's the summary of everything. So essentially, Good. it we just uh, took out the requirement for the mobility features in the town center and replaced it with uh, just residential units and the same language essentially as a sure. set of housing zones. And I think we had a fairly good discussion at our last meeting concerning this, but again, for other commission members uh, who may not have been there or commission members that were there, if there's additional uh, comments that they'd like to make. Seeing none, again, this is a public hearing. Any members of the public like to speak on the, uh, this application, please come forward and name an address. Good evening, Joe Mira from Economic Development Commission. This also was discussed at our previous meeting, and it was a unanimous vote to go along with your suggestion. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other members of the public? Any further comments from commission members? I guess for my, uh, for my position, it appears uh, when I was looking at my notes, I kind of got over my skis when I was uh, talking about my comments on the first uh, uh, application again this is for the 40 units and again I fully support it I think it's going to hopefully create some uh, additional uh, or at least some interest in in developing within this uh, you know within this area so with that if there's no further comments from the public uh, I'd entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing mr. chairman I make a motion that we close the public hearing for application 905-22 a zoning text and map amendment for section 4.26 town center section 4.26.b.15 to create a new sub district to increase unit density allowances for market rate units to 40 acres a unit. I have a motion to close the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons, voting by Mr. Cohan. Yes. 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 And yes, at this point in time, I'd entertain a motion on the application. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve uh, application 905-22, a, a zoning regulation and map amendment to section 4.26, the town center, center sections 4.26.B.15 to create a new sub-district to increase unit density allowances for market rate units to 40 units an acre and to allow first floor accessory residential amenities because it will allow more opportunities for development within our reg regulations. We have a motion on the application. Do we have a second? second? Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohan. Yes. 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 And yes. Moving on. Comes us to uh, item number three. It's old business. It's a uh, site plan warehouse, five research parkway, Wallingford LLC, five research parkway. The applicant would uh, come forward to begin preparing for uh, their presentation. And Mr. Allison, please note all correspondence for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a memorandum from our town engineer dated June 28, 2022. We have correspondence from our town planner dated August 10, 2022. And interdepartmental referral Date of receipt, August 8th, 2022, from our fire marshal. Correspondence to Calaire Properties from our town planner, dated August 24th, 2022. A document entitled Traffic Overview with received date of August 5th, 2022. Correspondence from Jeffrey Dewey at BL Companies to Allison Kapuscinski, town engineer, dated September 30th, 2022. Correspondence from Jeffrey Dewey at BL Companies to Kevin Pagini, town planner, dated September 30th, 2022. A document entitled Site Operations and Maintenance Plan, stamped revised, received date, stamped October 5th, 2022. A document entitled Traffic Overview, stamped revised, received stamp 
October 5th, 2022. Memorandum from Aaron O'Hare, environmental planner, to Kevin Pagini, town planner, dated October 6th, 2022. Email correspondence from a Jane Ronka to Kevin Pagini, dated October 11th, 2022. An inspection report from the Wallingford Fire Department containing an interdepartmental referral from the fire marshal. And that is stamped with a received date of October 19th, 2022. Correspondence from Kevin Pagini, town planner, and Allison Kapashinsky, town engineer, to Calaire Properties, dated October 20th, 2022. An interdepartmental referral from Vanessa Batista, registered sanitarian, date of receipt, August 8th, 2022. Correspondence from Dale P. Horrigan and family to Wallingford Planning and Zoning Commissioners, dated October 25th, 2022. Correspondence from Joan De Pasquale to the Planning and Zoning Commission, dated October 29th, 2022. Correspondence from Dr. Edmund Homan to Wallingford Planning and Zoning Commission, dated October 31st, 2022. Correspondence from James J. Perito Esquire to what appears to be Kevin Pagini. And there is no date on this. Correspondence from Vanessa Patista, Chief Sanitarian. Memorandum, perhaps, to Kevin Pagini, Town Planner, dated October 31st, 2022. An inter-office memorandum from Scott Shipman, Senior Engineer, to Kevin Pagini, Town Planner. Dated November 2nd, 2022. Correspondence from Jeffrey Dewey at BL Companies to Kevin Pagini, Town Planner. Dated November 2nd, 2022. Correspondence from Jeffrey Dewey at BL Companies to Kevin Pagini, Town Planner and Allison Kapuscinski, Town Engineer. Dated November 2nd, 2022. A document entitled Traffic Overview, stamped revised, stamped with the received date of November 2nd, 2022. Correspondence and addendum from Robert DeMeo to Wallingford Planning and Zoning Commission, dated November 4th, 2022. Memorandum from Janice Small, Corporation Counsel to Tevin to Kevin Pagini, Town Planner, dated November 3rd, 2022. Correspondence from James and Carol Mikulski to James Seichter, Chairman, Wallingford Planning and Zoning Office, dated November 22nd, 2022. Email correspondence from Linda Prinzorn to Kevin Pagini, dated November 3rd, 2022. Correspondence from Jane Kincaid to Kevin Pagini, dated November 3rd, 2022. Email correspondence from Scott Gray to Kevin Pagini, dated November 4th, 2022. Email correspondence from Jen Frechette to Kevin Pagini, Dated November 4th, 2022. Email correspondence from Cindy McCaffrey to Kevin Pagini, dated November 4th, 2022. Email correspondence from Janet Sizik to Kevin Pagini, dated November 4th, 2022. 
correspondence from Beverly Morse to the Planning and Zoning Commission, dated November 3rd, 2022. A document entitled Supplement to Application for Site Plan, dated November 14th, 2022. Email correspondence from Joan Munger to Kevin Pagini, dated November 14th, 2022. A document entitled Construction Site Contingency Plan for Erosion Control and Emergency Spills, stamped with a received date of August 5th, 2022. A document entitled Erosion and Sediment Control Report, stamped with a received date of August 5th, 2022, and a set of site plans. Thank you, Mr. Allenson. And now at this point in time, if the applicant and or its representative please introduce themselves and begin their presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is James Perito. I'm an attorney with Halloran Sage in the New Haven office, 265 Church Street in New Haven. Um, I represent the applicant, Five Breeze Church Parkway, Wallingford, LLC, the owner and developer of Five Breeze Church Parkway. With me is uh, Jeffrey Jekaway, who is the uh, owner's representative. Also on our team tonight is, is Chris Gagnon and Jeff Dewey, uh, uh, Dominic Saltruda, and Pat all from the BL companies. Um, what I'd like to do is provide a brief overview of the application, the process that we've gone through, the standard of review, and the details will be reviewed by our engineers, by Chris, who's on my left. Um, the, the site plan here for Fire Richard Parkway is a site that I am certain you're all quite familiar with. Unlike prior applications for the site, which sought special permits for larger developments, we waited during the moratorium while you revised your regulations to create new zoning districts which focus on balancing development and the desire to protect water quality in this watershed area. We filed in August of this year uh, looking for site plan approval of a 450,000 square foot warehouse with 10,000 square feet of office and associated parking for cars and trucks in the new watershed interchange district, WI zone, and watershed protection area. The site consists of approximately 180 acres a substantial portion of which was previously developed as the site for the Bristol Myers Squibb um, research facility. The majority of the prior development and buildings have been demolished and removed. The WI zone, as approved by, by this commission, there was a power outage, um, in April of 22, provided that warehousing and distribution, excluding freight terminals and drop yards, are permitted by site plan approval, so long as the peak hour vehicle trips are less than 100, utilizing the standards in the most recent edition of the Trip Generation ITE. And that's in your section regulations 410B4 and 410C. So we first uh, filed our initial plans with the towns in the Wetlands Watercross Commission. We were granted approval by them on October 5th by an unanimous vote after several public hearings with input from the public and staff. The review was detailed and focused on the protection of the wetlands, the wetlands buffer, uh, the watershed, and water quality. Town engineer, Mr. Pagini, and the town's environmental planner, Ms. O'Hare, gave a detailed analysis and review of these plans, and our engineers and worked with staff to make the changes all the parties felt would enhance the protections that our design had already put in place. While stormwater is within your purview, the uh, Wetlands Commission and staff reviewed the proposed systems to ensure the wetlands and watershed would be protected. Notice of the wetlands approval was published the appeal period has passed and no appeal has been filed on that, nor can it be now. The application included all the required submissions set forth in Regulation 7.4, including required maps, surveys, and plans, open space and landscaping plans, staging plans, sedimentation and erosion control plans, traffic analysis pursuant to the applicable trip generation ITE, stormwater management plans, and utility and lighting plans. The applicant and the engineers met with town staff and reviewed the technical comments and suggestions set forth by st in staff comments which were, uh, included the town engineer, town planner, senior engineer from the water and sewer divisions, and the fire marshal. In addition, comments from the Wallingford Health Department were re reviewed and incorporated. Uh, town staff visited the site with the applicant's engineers to review technical aspects of the sedimentation and erosion control plans and stormwater systems. Um, thereafter, revised plans were submitted to reflect the compliance with the comments and the reports. The final plan revisions uh, are, are what you have before you tonight. All of the submitted plans meet all of the bulk standards for yards, coverage height, parking loading, landscaping lighting, and stormwater management. Um, I submitted a memo which sets forth most of this, but I wanted to point out a couple things. 
on a standard review for site plans. As set forth in the memorandum from Corporation Counsel Janice Small, dated November 3rd, quote, when a commission acts on a site plan application, it does so in an administrative capacity. If the plan meets the specific regulations, it must be approved. Uh, Attorney Small succinctly and correctly sets forth the standard for this commission, and the staff reports make clear that this site plan application meets those requirements. Um, other things, uh, before I have Chris um, review the compliance with the site plan objectives, I thought it would be helpful to look at your plan of conservation and development because under section 7.2A of your regs it says um, one of the things you're supposed to consider is the town plan of development that the proposed site plan shall be in general conformance with the intent of the town plan. However, the town plan doesn't uh, override or take precedent over the specifics of your regulation. So in your POCD that you adopted in 2016, in reference to this site in this area, under Chapter 2, it talked about growing Wallingford's economic base and attract diverse businesses. It, uh, it noted challenges include the impending departure of major employers in town, such as UPS, distribution facility, and the Bristol Mount Squibb Research Facility. <clears throat> Excuse me. Broadening the range of potential businesses that can take advantage of Wallingford's accessible industrial lands can help attract businesses, building the tax base, and local jobs. The, uh, it advised uh, work to locate new tenants for the, the Squibb facility, continue to monitor the situation, and explore incentives for further development. Under Chapter 7, Future Land Use Plan Recommendations and Consistency, it talked about the then existing zones, the I-5 and I-X, um, and it said where expansion and intensification of industrial and some commercial uses is desirable. Lastly, under Economic Development, it talked about as a highest importance was to attract new businesses to key industrial areas and work to locate new tenants or uses at the uh, Bristol Mile facility. Um, I think this development meets those objectives of the POCD while complying with the site man requirements. At this point, let me turn it over to Chris. He'll review the site plan objectives and how our, our plan meets that. Chris? Thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Gagnon. I am a professional engineer with BL Companies, 355 Research Parkway in Meriden, Connecticut. Thank you for taking the time to hear our application today. My part of the presentation is um, <clears throat> going to be twofold. We're going to walk through what the site plan shows, and then I'm going to hit on a couple of important points in your uh, regulations, uh, the, the standard regulations, as well as the new um, <clears throat> watershed zone and demonstrate how the plan in front of you is in compliance with that. Um, <clears throat> so what we are proposing, uh, as referenced before, is a total of a 450,000 um, square foot warehouse building with 10,000 square feet of that uh, to, um, to the office space. Uh, with that, you are required to provide, um, obviously, parking and loading into the warehouse itself. So we are providing 105 loading docks, and then there are 90, 96 uh, trailer parking spaces around um, around the, the the warehouse itself. Um, and then we have uh, 530 parking spaces to, to serve the warehouse. And at this point, I am going to, while I'm talking about the site, I am going to hit on one of the um, topics in your 7.2 site plan objectives uh, with respect to circulation and parking and traffic. Part of what this design provides is a separation of the tractor uh, trailer access to the site from the pedestrian vehicle parking, for lack of a better way to describe it. You can see that the, the um, trucks that need to come in to access the facility will follow this darker gray um, drive up to the site, and then the vehicles that are coming up to the site uh, for, for warehouse workers will be able to come in to the site using this first driveway and access the building never needing to cross the uh, traffic way of the trucks that are that are coming in so that um, you know hits on on um, 
7.2C uh, and D uh, in your regulations. I'll go through um, that list um, in a second, but I just thought while I was talking about a site, the site plan, it was important to note um, some of the ways that we are uh, in compliance with the regulations. Um, so we're proposing the warehouse on the, the southern portion uh, of the property with associated parking and loading. Um, we are accessing the site from Research Parkway uh, using the existing drive, uh, curb cut and drive where that uh, signal is with the um, food bank right now. The signal's turned off or, or in permanent flashing mode. Um, and we're, we're accessing the site through the existing driveway. Uh, we are proposing maintenance on the driveway, but that is the limit of our um, work in this area. And then from there, we take a, the vehicles take a right turn up to their parking, and the, the trucks would take a right turn just a little further on. Um, so along with compliance of the, uh, the zoning regulations, we also had to comply with the new watershed protection plan. And, um, and, and what that really establishes is it, it kicks up the landscape requirements, um, strengthens the stormwater management requirements, and then also introduces um, a new 100-foot non-disturbance non area that is outside of water courses and ponds. And what, what we're showing with that dashed line there, that represents the 100-foot buffer from water courses and ponds. Note it does not reference in the regulations the, the wetlands but we, we, we're also outside of the 100-foot the wetland buffer as well. But this new regulation, what it, what it triggers is essentially a, a non-disturbance area uh, for proposed activities within this 100-foot area. So what we did to make sure we complied with this, our original design, um, this driveway was a little closer to, to this pond, and to, to make the grading work, we were also proposing um, uh, slightly raising the grades of the, the existing driveway. Uh, to comply with this after meeting with town staff, um, we have uh, both the water department, engineering, planning, et cetera, um, put our heads together with town staff and we revise the entrance to the site off of the main road to be a little further up the road and to provide this 100 foot buffer um, so that um, none of our proposed activities would encroach within that 100-foot buffer. Um, currently, the existing driveway comes through there, so we will be, um, we, we will be um, taking that up. Um, but uh, so, so in doing that, we are removing um, activity from this 100-foot area in order to protect the uh, ponds and streams that that's on site. So that was, um, you know, w one of the main site designs that we, um, that we had to make sure we, we took care of uh, so that we were in compliance with that. Uh, another thing associated with that and reacting to this, um, the utilities do follow this spine road and we worked with um, water department and sewer department to propose our utility tie-ins outside of this buffer as well. So that also um, was a uh, revision to the plans in reaction to the, the watershed um, regulations. Um, again, big picture, uh, we are providing a robust stormwater management plan, erosion control plan, all vetted thoroughly through the, uh, the wetlands approval process. Um, the stormwater plan hits all the requirements of the new watershed district, as well as the erosion control plan. Um, so, so um, in terms of stormwater management, I think our little landscape plan here shows that a little better. Um, the, the main components of the stormwater management plan are the sand filters which are required in this zone, 
Um, so we have two sand filters. One is on this side of the world over here, and this is another larger sand filter that we have over here. And uh, we have a stormwater basin right here with a sediment floor bay um, and some infiltration <coughs> and uh, under drains to provide the required water quality. Um, and again, I'll do a full summary of it, but why this is important for the um, new watershed regulations, they require that um, for the water quality volume, all parking, all proposed parking and roads be treated with a diversion structure, a hydrodynamic separator, and then into the basin. So as part of our redesign to make sure we stayed out of the 100-foot um, area, we had to still make sure that our proposed parking and pavement complied with this sec section of the, um, the, the watershed regulations, 14.3.B.1B. Um, so for these, for all of our stormwater quality, we do have a diversion structure which then goes to the hydrodynamic separator, which then goes to the sand filter. So all of our proposed pavement um, is treated in this manner. You can see over here, we have our diversion structure, we have our hydrodynamic separator, which then goes into our sediment floor bay. Um, you know, this is good engineering design anyway, uh, but it also hits a key point of the, um, of the, the watershed um, protection regulations uh, that, that you folks have in place. Um, and another component of that is to encourage um, infiltration of stormwater. So another thing that we work through very closely with the wetlands department is that um, we are proposing a large perforated pipe along the front of the site on, along the front of the building, excuse me, that will uh, infiltrate uh, about half of the, the roof runoff. So um, between the infiltration of the roof runoff and what we're proposing in the stormwater management basins, uh, we're hitting some important parts of the watershed regulations, which is to encourage um, the, um, the, the infiltration of stormwater runoff and no direct channeling of untreated surface runoff uh, to the resources. So our, our stormwater management um, plan um, complies with that. Um, we also have a robust landscaping plan. That was another component of um, the watershed regulations. Um, not only, uh, we, all, um, we always showed uh, landscaping per, per requirements in our original application. Uh, however, um, part of the improvements, I think, in the watershed regulations is they require landscape islands every 15 parking spaces, and they also require it over in the loading area. So this is one thing that um, uh, planner uh, Pagini caught for us. So not only are we proposing it in the um, vehicle parking area, but we also propose the required landscaping in the trailer parking as well as in the in the vehicle parking area um, so that that was another part of how the watershed regulations um, required some I think very positive improvements to all site plans that will be in the zone by requiring these islands every 15 spaces at the end of aisles to um, so that that I thought was a um, another way where we're demonstrating compliance with that. So that is, is really a general overview of the site. I am ready to start clicking off some um, how we comply with 7.2 of the site plan regulations, the site plan objectives, and then the watershed zone. But before I go away from the site plan itself, uh, are there any questions, or would you like me to just jump into the regulations here? Any commission, at this point in time, any commission members would uh, 
have any questions on what's been presented so far or would they like the applicant to continue? Sir, I think that uh, we'd like you to uh, continue with your presentation. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. I just thought this would be an appropriate time to ask. Thank you very much. So, um, <coughs> with a site plan application, there, there's really um, a couple things that we need to demonstrate to you folks. Uh, Section 7.2 uh, provides the site plan objectives in, in your regulations, and there are uh, A through J um, requirements in, in, these, in, uh, in the regulations. Um, that, that we need to demonstrate with, uh, with our application. Um, uh, 7.2a speaks to the plan of conservation and development. That was covered uh, earlier in our presentation. This site is referenced directly in that. Um, section 7.2b speaks to public safety uh, with respect to accessibility for fire and police protection. We received comments from the um, fire department uh, when I say comments, we received a response back from the fire department where they had um, no comments. Um, again, to, to touch on safety for a little bit as I spoke of before, the site is designed, uh, which is really standard practice when you have vehicles and trucks coming into the same site. We totally segregate the, this traffic, so never will a um, employee of the building have to cross truck traffic to get to the site. So we really made it a point in this design to, uh, to provide that, that safety. Um, so that, that really hits on some, some of these overlap, as, as you guys, I'm sure you know. Um, so along with uh, the, the traffic and pedestrian access, um, the site itself um, pr provides that uh, safety. So that's A, B, and C. Um, circulation and parking, adequate off-street parking and loading. Um, we comply with what is required for, based on the size of our building, um, so adequate parking, and then we also comply with the loading. So that hits um, 7.2D. Um, uh, we have the uh, appropriate um, curbing and walkways and access um, to, to the building uh, for the safety purposes. Uh, 7.2E is landscaping and screening. Um, in, um, this is where we uh, need to make sure we, we comply with both 7.2 as well as the new watershed regulations. Um, so this plan in front of you complies with uh, section 6.14. You know, some of that is making sure that we are minimizing any new tree clearing because we're redeveloping an existing site. We, uh, we do minimize tree clearing. Um, the setback from the property lines is significant in both elevation and um, distance. We are, we are lower than our abutters to the east and we're approximately 1,000 feet away from Research Parkway, and then where we are um, a bit closer to uh, a residential zone, we have significant screening along the side where we abut the, the residential zone. So, um, so we are in compliance with not only 6.14, but in the, the new watershed regulations, um, as I discussed uh, a little earlier, um, that we have added the additional islands, we've added additional trees, we've added the, the additional shrubs um, to, to comply with um, the <coughs> requirements of, let me just get this, um, 4.10 D4, the landscaping. Um, so, so we hit that, so, so the, the landscaping is one where we need to make sure we hit 16.4 uh, as well as the new watershed regulation, and this plan does. Um, 7.2F speaks to lighting. Um, the photometrics demonstrate uh, appropriate light levels uh, to be used for safety. 
as well as minimizing any light trespass uh, off of the property. Um, so the uh, in, into um, into rights rights of way or residential zones. So the the lighting plan provides that as well as uh, the screening also helps with that. Uh, 7.2 G speaks to public health. Um, this site is served by uh, public water and sewer. Uh, it has been extensively reviewed by the water department and um, and we have a um, memo from, from the water department with uh, conditions of approval that we are happy with. Um, 7.2 H uh, speaks to preservation of sensitive environmental features. Uh, again, we went through an extensive wetlands uh, review process and we have redesigned the site to comply with the watershed protection regulations. Uh, there are no historic views or other significant features um, on site and we are in compliance with the, by the nature of, of this redesign and, and complying with the watershed regulations. Um, that helps us hit 7.2H. 7.2I uh, um, speaks to drainage. Uh, for this project, we have a comprehensive three-phase erosion control plan. Um, we infiltrate roof runoff. Um, all proposed parking and driveways is routed through the appropriate water quality require, um, BMPs as required by um, appropriate drainage design as well as your watershed regulations. Um, as required, all peak runoff rates and volumes are reduced uh, as a result of our stormwater design that I spoke about earlier. And uh, 7.2J speaks to water quality. Um, again, those, those somewhat overlap in that our stormwater design, our drainage design, uh, checks those boxes. Um, I think one thing to note, currently <coughs> the site only has a stormwater collection system which then discharges into um, the ponds and wetlands on site. So in my opinion, uh, the runoff leaving this site and our calculations also demonstrate that um, this, this, would be, uh, this would improve water quality as well as it will reduce uh, runoff rates and volumes. So in our own little way, it will um, reduce uh, the, the runoff rates and volume coming from the site, which will only help downstream, um, downstream issues. So as, as we've seen um, for the site plan, we have uh, section 7.2 of the regulations, um, A through J and it was really important that our plans and presentation um, hit those. The other section of the regulations that we obviously need to comply with is our new watershed protection zone. And um, a couple things that are very important uh, with respect to, to, to that zone. Um, so, one thing that's very important with this zone is the, uh, is the traffic that gets generated as a result of a development. The proposed development in front of you, um, per the regulations, we're required to use the most updated ITE generation to generate the traffic trips um, to put in our analysis. And based on our analysis of this size building, um, and the, the office associated with it, we are well under the 100 peak hour vehicle trips that um, uh, for this site. Um, so we are in compliance with, with that, uh, that section of the regulations. Um, the other important things I touched on a little bit, I'm not gonna read through the entire sections of regulations, but in terms of um, you know, the, the front yard, that was a, a big component of these new regulations. Our site, our, our building is approximately 1,000 feet away from Research Parkway, and it's about 700 feet from where our, our development starts. So we, 
we're well over that 100 foot front yard um, requirements. Another important part of the watershed regulations is the open space uh, on the site, 50% is required. We're well over that 50% and it's uh, requested in the regulations where feasible that the open space contain native species and the resource areas. So our open space uh, on this site, uh, luckily we have some very large wetland complexes that uh, allow us to comply with that. Um, stormwater management, I've hit that pretty hard, um, but the, the design complies with the, the watershed regulations. No direct untreated discharge. Um, all proposed parking is treated as I said. Um, 100 foot buffers between all the streams and surface waters um, through uh, the wetland process. We have a comprehensive O&M plan for the site. Um, the other part of that is landscaping. We definitely hit the landscaping requirements as discussed earlier in terms of the islands, um, shrubberies and plants. Um, so what we have here is a plan that we took great pains to make sure um, it complied with not only the um, original <coughs> zone which we're under, but making sure that the new detailed requirements of the watershed protection overlay were also hit. So I think we checked both the boxes with respect to the objectives of a site plan application, as well as the extra requirements that were um, that were placed upon us by being in the watershed um, district. So that includes my attempt to be somewhat succinct, but also comprehensive discussion of the application. Thank you, sir. So I take it that this concludes your presentation. Is Let that me correct? just uh, a couple points, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, we're open to any questions. We'd be happy to answer any. Uh, the town planner, I, I've seen he's proposed a motion for approval that has some conditions. We've reviewed all those. Um, we're certainly uh, in agreement with all the conditions and certainly can apply, uh, comply with all those. And we'd be happy to answer any questions from both the chair or any of the commission members that they may have at this point. Thank you. I'll just wait for the lights to come on. Hey, at this point in time, uh, before I go to uh, commission members for uh, questions, Mr. Pagini, uh, comments uh, on the application, if you would, please? Uh, yes. I think I had commented to the applicant uh, to potentially give a, an overview of the proposed operation as what you would expect daily, um, something like that. I believe you said you might do that during the presentation. So if you can maybe describe the operation, even though there's no it currently. Um, I think that would be helpful for commission members as well as the public. Be happy to. Um, Jeff, would you come to do that? Yeah. And before Jeff comes off, could you turn that light off, please? Oh, this one right in your face? That's great. <laughs> yep, check away with uh, Calair Properties. Maybe talk about the you know the the, the types of tenants that you're you're going to try to be getting in this building and what kind of operations they would be having. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Checkaway with Calair Properties. Um, so you know currently we don't have a tenant for the property, um, but uh, you can just pull that a little bit closer to you. As I can't a, pick you up. As the plan state, too, we're looking for a Class A uh, warehouse user uh, for the property, which would typically be a, a certain number of employees that utilize the, the parking spaces out front, as well as, um, you know, warehouse delivery usage of the trailer storage spaces. You know, we do anticipate uh, not limiting the hours of operation uh, for this type of use. But, I mean, in general, we, we look towards having a, a standard, you know, warehousing use that, you know, isn't a drop yard or some of the other things that were, you know, put forth in the new regulations that are not we're definitely planning to stay away from everything 
that is, is no longer allowed in the district per the revised uh, regulations. If there are specific questions, I can do my best to, to answer those for you. But. Sure. Commission members with uh, questions uh, for the applicant, whether it be for uh, the use or uh, just questions on the uh, application itself. Begin with Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just uh, could you explain then this Class A warehouse? You, you did mention in that uh, comment delivery and freight. Um, you know, can you give us a better feel for what a Class A warehouse is? Um, from a Class A warehouse, it, it's just a well manicured, maintained site. It's a building that's typically of this nature would be a, a tilt-up construction with uh, 40 foot clear storage uh, ESFR fire suppression to meet the needs of you know the classification of everything that would be stored in there um, some some small office component to serve that warehouse use I don't really think I mentioned anything related to freight but just general shipping well, you, and receiving on the where on, on warehouse product so um, basically, you, you did, did mention as a delivery type operation, and you know since you brought it up, um, I guess I might as well get into a few of my comments. That you know this description of a warehouse, you know without knowing who your tenant is, um, causes a lot of questions in my mind is to the, you know, how this fits into our regulations, quite frankly. Maybe I can help with that. Um, well, I'm, I, okay, let, I'm sorry, let me finish. finish your question. Um, I, I'm sure you can, but I, <laughs> I want to say what I want to say. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of uh, warehouses, according to the ITE land use codes, right? There's number 150, which is warehousing. Then you get into 151, mini warehouse, 154, high cube transload warehouse, 155, high cube fulfillment center, 156, high cube parcel hub warehouse, 157, high cube cold storage. So when you say warehouse, according to our regulations based on um, you know, what's written, you're talking 150. Then again, based on the size of this, which is 440,000 square feet, and you just mentioned that you've got 40 foot high walls. This falls into a major distribution center, not a warehouse. Um, so th this is, you know, where I struggle with, you know, what you've presented as far as fitting into, you know, the regulation for this site. So. Okay, I'll be happy to answer that. I, I think that you know, under your regulations, the, there's no distinction under warehouse and distribution. Uh, what you point to is calculating the trips based upon the ITA. And our traffic engineer who's here, and I'm happy to have her come up and, and go into detail on the report. And the report you have submitted, the October 31, uh, 2022 dated one, which was a minor change from September, which just clarified the, uh, the correct zone. Um, you're correct. Uh, sh they used the, the 150 designation um, based upon the size that's in there. And, and by using that um, required manual, the the trips that are calculated are actually done very conservatively. So it's, it's not an estimation based, you know, that is underestimating what could be there. Um, it's, it's actually overestimating which actually can be there. I think that if, um, if there was another standard, it's not set forth in the regulations. And a, a warehousing that uses this square footage by the nature of how you're describing how to calculate the trips, it fits that definition. So I think that's what we have to follow. One of the difficulties in trying to have um, you know, an actual tenant is when you don't, in the, in the prior 
applications that would come in, when there's not a sort of certain um, path towards approval, you really can't find a specific tenant because it's it's somewhat speculative and it's also um, it's it's within your purview with a special permit application to grant or not grant. The site plan gives more certainty, so that's why we've tried to fit your application to your regulations, uh, having gone through the the moratorium and, and putting in the new regulations and changing the zone. And our focus has been, quite honestly, you know, to the extent we can in all regards, protecting the watershed, protecting the, the wetlands, protecting the assets on, on the property that your regulations have asked us to do. On the, on the traffic end, um, we think that using the regulations you've pointed us to, and your, and your town engineer has agreed, that the trips that are coming in here, which are about 80 at peak, um, makes us in compliance. Now, if, if we end up having a tenant, and if it turns out that they're a different classification, then maybe we have to come back to you at that point, if it's not gonna fit that definition. So. Again, for, for me as a commissioner, without knowing what that ultimate use is going to be, you know, we're just approving, you know, a building. We, we don't know. This is a land use board. We don't know how that site is going to be used without knowing who that tenant is. Um, you know, getting, getting into the traffic, um, <clears throat> from my calculation, and I, I'm certainly not a traffic engineer, but you're, you're pretty close to what you said as far as 80 trips. I used a .019 multiplier, and I got I got 88 uh, peak hour trips. So we're we're getting pretty close to 100. And I don't know if the engineer wants to uh, um, weigh in on that number, but if you go into the higher um, uses that I've mentioned, for instance, if you want to use a 156, you know you, you're creating 111 uh, peak hour trips. So again, the, the, the use of this is, um, you know, what me personally as a commissioner is, I'm trying to figure out and let's, you know, well, make let's, that decision. Let's have our, we'll have our traffic uh, person come up and, and try to explain that to you. That might be the best way to do it. So uh, it, th that's fine. And since we're going to talk about traffic, mm -hmm. you know, the last meeting, um, with Amazon, there's a lot of discussion on, um, you know, the access roads, 68, um, Research Parkway, and every meeting, I asked the same question of, I think it was Mr. Dewey, um, no, uh, the other traffic engineer. Um, those roads are currently at a class, some of them are class C, um, class D, where right now without this warehouse. And additional, we have other warehouses in that area now too. Um, I asked him every meeting, how much more traffic can be added to make these intersections fail? And we didn't get an answer for that. So, um, you know, that is another traffic concern that I have because unfortunately, this item should be taken into consideration as far as whether or not we can approve this. This does touch into you know, safety and some of the other traffic concerns that are, are mentioned in you know, Regulation 7.2, et cetera. Um, so you know, those are a couple of my traffic concerns. And again, go back to the old application where you know the exits on 91 north and south are you know um, not failing but close to failing you know the peak hour on 68 that left hand turn into uh, research parkway um, you know is is almost at the failure point and one of the other things i wanted to since we're talking about traffic um, in your traffic overview, item 218.22i, 
you know, you've got this nice, nice big diagram of the, the turning uh, radius of the trucks. And it's turning from 68 into uh, Research Parkway. And I'd like to find out why you have that in there. You know, is that a concern to us? And actually, <laughs> the two pictures don't look any different to me, so I'm trying to figure out what the difference is. You have, you know, uh, photo one and photo two, but they look right. identical. Um, so th those are a lot of the, the traffic concerns as well. And then, you know, I don't know when you went to the fire marshal if he's aware of, you know, how high these walls are going to be. And in your site map, and I can, I've dog-eared it so I can dig it out if you want, but, you know, you mentioned the 40-foot the walls. But you also have a provision in there where you might want to raise those, uh, the heights of the walls. You, you got a plus or minus in the specs there. So I'd like to find out, you know, is it 40 or is it, is it going to be more? Um, you really didn't get into a lot of detail on, um, you know, the size of this building and uh, things like that. Um, certainly the storage loading docks can be rearranged if, uh, you know, there's a different uh, use that comes up with the tenant. Um, and going back to the fire marshal with that 40-foot uh, wall, again, I'm not sure if he was made aware of that, but there are special uh, considerations for the fire department if, if the walls are that high. And I'm... I don't know if they have any uh, standard uh, procedures now for any 40-foot high, you know, buildings here in town. But again, the, the, the use, the tenant, and the equipment that potentially, you know, could go in that warehouse does impact how the fire department's going to work. Because if there's a lot of automation in there, you know, they're going to have to understand, um, you know, what's in there to fight a potential fire. Um, so, you know, these are a lot of the uh, questions that, you know, again, you, you haven't really gotten into a lot of this detail. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, I spent a lot of time going through these documents to, to figure some of this information out which you know quite frankly I think you should have you know presented to us so we didn't have to uh, um, you know see what was missing and I, I, I think a lot of the, the info um, you know we had to dig for it at least I did. Um, so Again, as far as is parking, um, you know, the numbers really don't add up. Uh, you, you've got 530 parking spaces, yet you're saying you have less than 100 peak hour trips. I don't see how those numbers work out. You know, if you have less than 100 peak hour trips, how many, how many people are going to be on site? And again, it's going to be based on tenant and what you put in there. But you don't know that, and we certainly don't know that. So how, how can we base a decision on not having that information? Um, if we could have Pat come up, she'll, the traffic consultant, she'll be able to describe some of that. Because in fact, I, um, I went through that the other day with her on that aspect. So I'm happy to have that stuff answered. Um, so I, I think. I think I've said pretty much uh, uh, I have for this this one one question. Okay. So, thank, thank you. you. Um, Pat, could you come up? Maybe. For the record, my name is Pat Padlow, and I'm a professional engineer as well as professional traffic operational engineer, and I work for a company, BL Companies. At Research Parkway in Meriden. Pull that a little Hello. bit closer to you. There you go. Um, to address some of your comments, or just to start off, um, 
For this analysis or for this application, we have utilized a warehouse land use code 150 uh, from ITE Trip Generation Manual 11 edition. You are correct to state that all the traffic that is being generated using that land use code um, generates less than 100 trips, meaning it's not a significant amount of uh, traffic to warrant a traffic study based on ITE trip ITE. Um, major traffic generator, um, um, uh, if there's a need for a study, S similarly, um, OSTA, similarly, Connecticut DOT OSTA states that if you generate less than 100 trips, there is no need, it's not a major traffic generator, there is no need for a traffic, uh, for a traffic study. What I also want to address is you've mentioned several, several codes of warehousing. You've mentioned 150, 150, 150, which is what we're using, 154, which is high cube transload, um, 155, 156, and 157. What is interesting across all of those, uh, with the exception of high cube parcel hub warehouse, which is specific to Amazon, um, the 150 warehousing is the most conservative out of all of them. The 156 high cube parcel hub warehouse is also limited by amount of number of samples that ITE could utilize to generate those values. So when you compare it apple to apples based on the square footage, 150 warehouse is the most conservative and again it generates least amount of trips across all of them with the exception of 156. So, yeah, if I could just interrupt you there. Sure. Um, again, my, uh, yes, and I, I was basing my multiplier on 150, and I believe it was 0 0.19, um, and I came up with 88, is, is, which is a little more than what you, you so folks. So you probably used the 10th, I don't have the, the actual multiplier in front of me, but I'm assuming it, it might be just the updates between uh, the IT trip generation manual between the 11th and 10th. The 11th seems to be a little bit different when it comes to warehousing because they provided yeah, additional I think I categories. Had 11. So. Um, but, it, but again, 80, 88 is, it's not 100, but it's 10% more than 80. So. Understood. Uh, then we also, um, had a comment on the uh, left turn movement off of one six, uh, Route 68. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something in the graphics, we're presenting them because uh, this is something that we were required or asked in the previous application with Connecticut DOT, OSTA office. So in uh, anticipation when we go through the official process, again, um, we're hoping that this is gonna be an administrative decision with OSTA we will have to present to them again, how do we impact the state uh, roadway? So we are um, providing the information that um, uh, CT Route 68, uh, the double left turn into Research Parkway operates with a, uh, a throat width of 37.5, but um, the guidelines suggest 30. Interestingly enough, Connecticut DOT recently has resurfaced the roadway and uh, the striping was uh, kept the same way from what I understand or in the vicinity of it. So it's something that will bring it to their attention again when we uh, go through the AD process with uh, the OSTA office. So, yeah, so if I could interrupt you again. Of course. Um, you know, I'm looking at the uh, charts uh, TT-2 that, you know, show the scenario one versus scenario two. And, you know, again, they, they look identical. And uh, I don't know what the uh, distinction is in this left-hand turn as far as the trucks. And I, in both scenario one, scenario two, you say revise lane width to 11. It's restriping of the roadway to provide a wide turn. So both trucks, if there's a need for two trucks taking a left, they'll fit. Right. 
And they can. The roadway is the roadway width is there. It's just a matter of shaping. Okay, I, you know, again, I, I see no. Di I, I get it now, Understood. but I, I don't see any difference in the, you know, one and two. So that that was my question, um, and you know, this intersection, um, again, came up in the Amazon uh, warehouse because this left-hand turn, and the 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 call it the middle lane left-hand turn from, I believe it's 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., Monday through Friday, that is left turn only. And there's a little sign, a couple hundred yards, maybe a hundred yards up in front saying to all the cars, you know, what the situation is here. And I happen to drive through this quite frequently, and every time I'm, I know to stay over in the right-hand lane. But you know what? Nobody else does it. And, um, no comment. Yeah, you know, again, with, with the increase in traffic, um, again, which was not uh, really accounted for the, the side streets, this, to me, is, is still a major uh, issue as far as, you know, what's going to happen on the site. And again, you can see the, um, the off ramp here, and um, you know this, <laughs> and I think Mr. Pagini mentioned it in in his comments where OTSA needs to uh, you know weigh in on this, and they may or may not um, have any any comments on this, and you know quite quite frankly they they, they need to have positive comments on this. They, they can't administratively, you know, look at this and say, yeah, it's going to be okay, because it's, it's really not okay now. And I think with, uh, you know, the additional uh, traffic generated, again, less than 100 trips, peak, peak trips, but, but close, um, you know, and again, it wasn't accounted for in, in, the, in the presentation, the study, the comments. You know, I, th I think it does impact how, on how we have to react to this application. Maybe I can make some clarification on that. Okay. This is not a special permit. This is a site plan. And if I can just... I understand that. Let me point out... I understand out, that completely. Under Pansy Road versus Town of uh, Plan and Zoning in Fairfield, 2007, Supreme Court case, it reiterated that the standard that once a zoning authority establishes that a particular use within a zone is permitted, a conclusive presumption arises that such a use in general does not adversely affect the traffic that's in the zone. That's not to say that the state um, OSTA won't look at this. They will. They have to. It's their jurisdiction. It's what they look at. The, your commission can look at internal traffic, internal flow, internal um, um, uh, traffic uh, safety. That's totally within your purview. And I think that we talked about that with the separate driveways and keeping the pedestrians from the parking area separate from the truck areas. But when you, when you have a site plan um, approval process, off-site traffic is not really within your jurisdiction. It's within the states, and they're going to have to look at that. And if they feel something has to happen, we'll have to deal with them on that regard. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I know that may not, be, may not be the answer you want, but I think that's the law, and I think that's how your regulations are set up. So, I mean, I would like, Pat, to talk about the, um, the parking because I had that exact question. Why is it that we have um, this number of spaces and why, why that's generated that way? And maybe, Pat, you can talk about that. Um, yeah, be, before you do that, again, I just want to uh, respond to your, your comment. And yes, I, I understand what you just said in reading the uh, uh, case law. I read that in the application. I read that in your uh, recent memo. Um, and I'll bring it back and say, without understanding completely who this tenant is, um, it, it's a false equivalent. We cannot determine factually what the traffic is going to be. So that's, again, um, you know, something, again, the, 
fellow commissioners are going to have to, you know, figure out. So. Matt, can you talk about the? Um, so I, I know there was one question with regards to the number of parking spaces, vehicle, uh, passenger vehicle parking spaces versus uh, the number of trips that we're generating. Um, two points that I would like to make is uh, the less than 100 uh, peak hour generated traffic is, le um, it's not the peak time or peak number of vehicles generated by the site. And then because there's a potential that the warehousing could operate um, in more than one or two um, shifts, we need to accommodate additional parking for switch of shifts. And that, that's why we're um, forecasting that many parking spaces. And the, this is Chris Gagnon again with the L companies. And the peak hour is just one hour. There are 24 hours in a day. So it's only accommodate, it only speaks to that, that individual hour. So there'll be vehicles coming. Sir, if you could please. There'll be vehicles. Uh, that ding was for me. There'll be vehicles coming and going um, more than just one hour uh, a day. So the, the, the peak hour speaks to just that moment, uh, that 60 minutes throughout the day. So um, it's not directly equivalent to how many cars will be parked on site. If I could just follow up on that. Again, when we're looking at this, looking at your, you know, at the traffic study, the first traffic study that you had was uh, in August. And that's where you had the, you know, the 356 car parking sp uh, spaces. And then it was the 97. And then back in September and then in October, they were pretty much the same traffic studies that you prepared. I think the last one was certified. And then you went up to the 530 cars. And again, the trailer spaces were uh, 96. They were down just a little bit. But in all three of those, you know, you indicated that the, uh, the total in and out of the facility was about 700 and, I guess, 749. Seven, so we call it 750. So. I, I, Again, then I'm looking at come back to the number of parking spaces you're proposing. Uh, if you're having just 750 in and out, so that's 375, whatever the math is on that, uh, really vehicles coming in. I, I'm looking at the, the increase in the parking to the 500 and whatever. And I, again, I understand you say, well, we may have shifts, we may have all of that. So I understand that, but it's still just the number of you know, it's just the number of trips that are coming in there. I, I just, I'm looking at the, the 550 or whatever it is, the five something, the increase, and, and just struggling to see how that makes, how, how that jives, if you would. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go <clears throat> give this a try. So um, a, a couple things to, this is Chris Gagnon again. A um, couple things to take into consideration with the, um, with the parking spaces and ITE and um, your regulations. The, the parking lot, uh, the parking provided on any site needs to comply with the bulk zoning requirements of the zone that we are in and the proposed use. So the, the site plan design begins with, with that as, as our target mm. number. Um, and I believe that and the um, just based on the zoning requirements uh, the total uh, required number of spaces is 480 spaces um, so based on your regulations that would be the absolute minimum that we would be allowed to build on this site based on this zone um, your regulations also allow for a uh, hundred and twenty percent um, increase from that um, total required number. Uh, our five hundred and thirty is well below that one hundred and twenty percent increase. So the the parking uh, lot that is uh, proposed on these plans uh, complies with the requirements of the 
um, your, your regulations with respect to, to parking for this use, and it also complies with the watershed zone uh, regulations, which allows for up to 120% of, of that um, required space. And I think we get into an apples and oranges situation when we start comparing ITE to exactly the number of spaces that are, are on the site. Um, it's a different set of regulations that we're demonstrating uh, compliance with, and they're not necessarily one directly uh, tied to the other. Yeah, no, I fully understand that. But Mr. Pagini, if in fact, because again, this is in the watershed, uh, and certainly what we want to do or look to do is to reduce the parking requirements. If in fact, uh, I understand what our regulations say, and I understand what you're saying, because you have two separate things. You have the ITE and you have that, so I, I get that. Uh, but as far as the commission looking to reduce the number of spaces based upon what's being presented to us as far as uh, the ITE numbers and, and what they're saying, here's coming in, here's coming out. What latitude does the commission have as, as far as reducing the number of parking spaces? Uh, well, in the new WI regulations, we did allow for the commission to waive up to 75% of the required parking area uh, if the applicant demonstrates that such a waiver is warranted, provided that an equal area to the space. Slow down, Mr. Pagini, please. Provided that an equal area to the space required for such parking, topographically suited for parking, and in addition to the minimum open space area requirement shall be reserved at the site in conformance with the requirements of this chapter, and any later use of this reserved area for actual parking would allow the property to remain conforming uh, in regard to the open space requirements of this district. Uh, so it would. So at the end of the day. If we wanted to, <laughs> right. if we want, we're looking at the 356, and whether that's that number or whatever number, what what ability do we have to, to lower that? They're looking at the 500 and something is what they're presenting. You'd have the ability, but it would be up to the applicant to I understand. obviously uh, agree to that. Um, no, I understand. So, town staff would be amenable to the reduction in parking uh, requirements provided that um, if they do potentially have a tenant and they do need more parking, then they would have to come back. Uh, so I don't know how you would want to, uh, to work that out, but it would, the waiver would have to reserve the area on site. So obviously the site would still be in conformance with the open space. Um, and obviously they're showing more now, so anything that would, that would be there would be already presented yeah. on the site plan. Yeah, you can see what I'm kind of driving at, maybe in an awkward way. We have, you know, we have two, you know, two things. You're, you're having your, the ITE says this amount of, tra of traffic, the 700 and whatever. But then you're showing on your plans that, well, I need more parking spaces to accommodate the 375 whatever uh, 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 trips that, that, that are coming in and the 375 that are coming out. And... To me, if I look at it and say, if your folks are saying, well, I need 536 or whatever the number is, uh, then I look at that, and again, I understand what the ITE says, but it's, it, it seems to say to me, well, there's going to be more trips coming in and out. You know, there's going to be more than just the 750 total in and out combined uh, with the additional parking spaces. There's going to be more than that, and then does that trigger from... 80 or 88, pick a number, as far as what the uh, peak hour number is, does that trigger the number coming higher? You know, that's, th there just seems to be some inconsistencies. Again, I fully understand what you're saying. We're looking at two different things, but I'm having a tough time reconciling it. Maybe it's just me. Um, I, th I think I, uh, I think the question was somewhat reiterated, and I think I gave our um, oh, I understand what our, you said. Our, our, our response. Um, the you know I I just at the risk of somewhat repeating myself. Um, traffic to a site is generated by the use. You could have. 
three parking spaces and be grossly underparked, you would still have the same traffic coming to your use. You could have four billion parking spaces and be way overparked. The traffic is generated um, by the use. So just the concept of having additional parking spaces does not necessarily trigger more trips. So I don't think having a parking space number necessarily, uh, the number of parking spaces doesn't necessarily um, invalidate. No, I understand. So I, I think just to kind of sum this up, at the end of the day, you're basically saying you don't need the 500 and some odd parking spaces. The 300 and whatever it is, 56 works for you. I think that's what I'm hearing. If we have, if, if tomorrow, you, you know, we have an approval and we can get a tenant that comes in and it turns out that we don't need the five, uh, that number of spaces, we'll come back and ask for the reduction and come back to you to do that. At this point, we don't know that. and We can't really limit ourselves because the, the parameters of, of what we're fitting into meet your regulations. And also, you know, the, the counts that come in, and it's, it is sort of interesting how it, the number of spaces and the number of counts uh, for the hours don't seem to line up, but that's how the calculation works. Because often you may have, if it's like a shift kind of thing, you have a parking space there, someone's coming in, um, there's more spaces, but they're not necessarily using those because they're coming in and out at different times of the shifts. So I, my, what I would say is that if we have a tenant um, in the future and we're able to come in and ask for the waiver and show that we meet the requirements in your rigs for the, for the reduction, we'll come in and do that. We, you know, we don't want to have more spaces, frankly, build more spaces than what our tenant would need. So if, by using that logic then, if you're coming in to request it, then you'd have to, I would suspect, do another traffic study for us, which could then trigger it being a, uh, putting it into a, uh, into a special permit then. Because if you're, if you're saying I need the more spaces because I'm having more cars coming in or the, the use is, and I, I would assume then you'd have to uh, look at, again, the peak hours and in, in, in all of that. I'm not following that. that. I mean, if, if we'd be coming in to ask for less spaces. If, if a tenant comes in and says they don't need that many spaces, it would be, it would be less trips. Well, maybe, but I... I that's why I'm not I, a traffic engineer. Yeah. <laughs> and Pat, if you have an answer, that's fine, but I'm not a traffic engineer. Not sure if that answers my questions, but I think we're uh, probably have other commission members who would like to comment. Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I could, through you, I guess my first question um, is for our town planner. Um, sitting here, listening, reading, absorbing. Um, can you tell me the date of the application and when this commission has to decide by? Uh, the date of the uh, submission was August 5th, and I believe the applicant can uh, extend it another 30 days beyond today, uh, but they would have to consent to an extension. So we're not, we're not required to vote on it this evening? Uh, you would be. They would have to consent to the extension. Okay. Because as, as I wasn't here in October, I, I noticed that the applicant sent a letter agreeing to consent. So I wasn't yes. sure why he consented in October if it wasn't necessary. Because it was over well, the 65 days. October was. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. And then, um, again, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, to, to the town planner, um, I don't have in my package um, the letter from the town engineer dated November 4th, 2022. You provided some summary in your notes to the commission, but I don't have the original. Do you have a copy I could look at? Uh, it wasn't a memo. It was comments that she had done uh, at a letter that was submitted quite recently. So she had just emailed me the comments and I included them in your packets. So what I have here is her exact verbatim or is Correct. it your summary of her? No, it was her exact verbatim that she had uh, instructed me to put into the notes. Okay. I, I mean, I, I received again through you mr chairman we received all the emails from the members of the public but we don't have the email from the town engineer 
Well, I could provide that. It's what, what, I'd, what I'd offer is it's unusual because I'm looking for correspondence and, and your comments to us say, town engineer also had some comments for the commission in response to Robert DeMeo's comment letter dated November 4th. They are as follows. So yes. I was looking for her, her memo, email, or something. All I have is your notes to the commission. So is there anything additional or this is it? No, this is it. Okay. And I can provide that email if necessary. Yeah, I would like a copy. Um, I think if I, I know, and I, I do, do not disagree with either of the prior speakers, and I'm trying to focus my questions differently. Um, again, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the applicant. Um, so the, the town planner said you applied in October. Um, have you had more than 10 meetings with the town staff? Any official in town of Wallingford? I personally have not. Um, I would have to ask Chris if he has. A yes or no? It's, 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 sorry. it's right around 10. Okay. Between wetlands meetings, uh, meetings with uh, commissions, meeting with, with planners, meetings with town engineer, meetings on site. Um, I mean, I, okay. it's not like I was keeping track of every single one, but <laughs> there was a whole bunch right. of them. There's, yeah, and I appreciate that. I, as I'm looking through the, the volume, if I might, thank you. As I'm looking through the, the, the volume of data, it, it, this, this reflects a lot of activity for a site plan, not a special permit. And, and I know I had a prior conversation with the town planner some time ago that this was applied for as a site plan. And um, judging from the notes, you know, the 180 acre site, the 24 hour, seven day a week operation, the vehicle trips, it's as a, this is probably the most significant site plan I've ever seen while I've served on the commission. Um, the building orientation, is it facing Research Parkway? The building is essentially running parallel with Research Parkway. I don't know if it's facing it. The um, pedestrian access is on the, the southern side. Um, not quite sure. Our regulations require that buildings face the street. We changed the regulations recently. So it's just a question, is, is the front of your building facing the street? It's not a commercial building. It's not a residential building. So I don't know if they really have fronts or sides. Our, our regulation, as you've been talking this evening, refers to buildings should have a front orientation. It doesn't specify commercial or residential. So. It just, it's a question, and I heard during your presentation you talked about the front of the building with the loading dock, so I'm just saying, is that the front of the building? I have not defined what the front of the building is. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd have to discuss that with my applicant. I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but it's, it's, it's not a... It's not a commercial structure where the public is coming in. This, this building we're in has, has a front. It, this is a different type of structure. It doesn't, it's, it's not visible from the road, and it doesn't really lend itself to a, sort of a front or a back. I mean, there's, there's sort of loading docks on both sides. It would be hard, be hard to say. I mean, you could say the loading docks are the front because that's it's functioning as a warehouse. It, it really is whatever the owner designates as a front. I, I, yeah, and I, I guess the reason I ask the question is, in relation to our regulations, you're telling us how you comply, so I'm just asking, does the, does the, is the front of the building comply with our regulation? So which is the front? I, I, I mean, I, I'm not, it's a fair question, I guess. It yeah, it's absolutely fair. It's just in yeah. the context of this particular building, it's, like, it's not something you would think of, but we could, we could have the side that's facing Research Park be the front. We could designate that the front of the building. All right. And then my understanding under our site plan objectives, 
and our regulations um, to the town planner. Anyone in Wallingford in their official capacity review the traffic information other than you and the town engineer? Uh, no, the town engineer reviewed the traffic. Okay. So, and because it's a site plan, we don't have the ability to ask for a peer review or an, a second opinion for someone representing the town, correct? Correct. And then if I could go back to the question um, Commissioner Cohen asked, um, he was asking about class A examples. Um, is there someone there? Would FedEx be considered class A? Uh, FedEx actually would fall into probably 156 category. I'm sorry, class A or not class A? Not, not class A. I don't believe it's class A. And what if is we're going, I'm sorry, I don't know the class A. I, if I were to go by ITE trip generation manual, it would not fall under 150 warehousing, FedEx. Right, Commissioner Cohen was, was asking, it, was, it relates to what is a class A, and, and no, none of them were named, so I, while others were talking, I'm thinking, well, FedEx has warehousing, the different uses of it, but I'm just curious, would that be considered class A? Uh, Jeff Checkway again with Calair Properties. I don't really, I'm not really sure how to answer the question. I don't think that naming the tenant FedEx uh, is there a specific use. Do they only use buildings for one use in their portfolio or do they have multiple different uses among their portfolio? Well, yeah. Right, I guess the reason I asked the question is Commissioner Cohen had asked what is class A? And then, and, and I, he didn't ask, and I, was, I wanted to ask as a follow-up, can you give an example of a class A? And I presented as FedEx an example of class A. So FedEx has ground operations, airport operations, and, and various types of operations, all different. Is any of that considered class A would be the question. I, I'm trying to get a know. visual, because I'm not in warehousing. <laughs> and, and this is our opportunity to talk about it, so I'm just trying to get a mental picture of what would be class A. I know what class A is in real estate, but again, I'm not, this is warehousing. When I said class A, I was defining the, the type of the building, the, the height, the type of fire suppression system, um, the qualifications of the building. I wasn't name, going towards naming a tenant. Right, no, I, yeah, okay. I, I guess, I, I know you're not gonna name a tenant, I didn't ask you to name a tenant, I just asked you to give an example of a class A, and so I was proposing FedEx, but I, I think I understand where you're going. Um, then I guess, I just, if I could, Mr. Chairman, just to paraphrase the information, um, the applicant's representative verbalized that you've seen the conditions of approval from the town planner, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you, do you have the comments from the traffic, from the town engineer dated November 4th that I mentioned? We'll, look, um, we'll try to pull it up. November 4th. Hey, you gentlemen like to, uh, you're, you're looking at the question now. The notes. Hmm? It's here and then it can, it continues on. Sure. Mr. Chairman, can I just interrupt for a second? Absolutely. I, I, just to interpret the town engineer's um, comments, I think she's referring to Mr. DeMeo's letter dated November 4th. I don't think she's saying she had a letter. At least that's how I read it. Right, right. I, yeah, and I appreciate that. No, I, I read that. I, I know Mr. DeMeo. I, I guess it was just the, I thought there'd be something from her. Um, what I want to get to is her memo talks about the fact that um, the, the traffic memo still contradicts itself. An OSTA review 
will be required, all capital, as the development is over 100,000 square feet and 200 parking space, though exceeding only one of those warrants, the, though exceeding only one of those warrants is owes to review. That's explained on page two. This is later contradicted in the first paragraph of the conclusion on page three, where it states an OSTA review will not be required. She anticipates, paraphrasing her paraphrase, I it says, I anticipate OSTA will review this as a MTG, which stands for Major Traffic Generator, due to the modifications proposed to Route 68 turn lanes onto Research Parkway. Therefore, I have no say in this decision and my opinion, my opinion is purely, purely speculation. So I, I guess the question to the applicant is, is that your understanding on the OSTA review? Because she is referencing in her memo or comments she provided to the town planner, which he paraphrased to us, that there is a contradiction in your um, traffic information. So a uh, couple things there. Um, it will. 1,000% be reviewed by OSTA due to the number of parking spaces and size of the building. I think that one not in the end of the report was just a typo. It will need to go to OSTA. The concept of the different types of OSTA reviews, there are two types. There's an administrative determination and a major traffic generator. The difference between those two is limited to whether proposed off-site improvements would be required. So it's the same application and the same submittal that, that is provided, uh, not to put words in the town engineer's mouth, but based on potential recommendations of something as simple as a lane restriping that would make it a major traffic generator. And that, that does not mean that you need to rebuild an exit ramp off of 91. Or, there is no, um, once you have a proposed offsite improvement, it could be adding a stop bar somewhere. The simplest offsite improvement, it's considered a major traffic generator. So it's, it's not based on being major or very impactful for traffic. It is only based on the concept of a potential site improvement, off-site improvement would be required, like the left turn lanes, for example. So it doesn't make it any more impactful on the roadway it just may have one of those recommended things. Some tree clearing for sight line would make it a major traffic generator. My recollection is when they passed that, I think it was 14.311 might have been the statute that sort of defined major traffic generators. It was when the shopping malls were all going up back in the probably late 70s, early 80s. And they defined it as the number of parking spaces and the number of square footage, which nowadays when you think of some of the stuff that's been built since then, mm -hmm. um, Pretty much everything falls in that category for the most part. But that's, I think, it's just like a, a mis, sort of a misnomer. So I think Chris explained that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other commission members? Mr. Allenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. I've got a lot of stuff in front of me. Um, I did have a question for our town planner. Um, this is the first time I've ever seen something like this, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to ask if you've had a conversation with our registered sanitarian about the application? Uh, I did, they just mentioned the well lasting in her comments. Um, that was the bulk of her comments to me. I guess my question is her comment on the interdepartmental referral which it says that it's suggested well testing. She suggests well testing. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering if that is a typical comment, because I haven't seen it in my time on this commission. I've never seen that comment before. And is that just a peremptory recommendation, 
or is there something, I mean, it presupposes that, in my mind, it presupposes that something's missing uh, regarding the construction. And I just wanted to know if this is just a normal concern with this type of a build and because being in the location that it's in and the type of plan that is being planned, she's recommending this or? She said it's common state regulatory language when any blasting is done uh, in, in proximity to wells. So um, I believe the applicant spoke directly with the health department to address those concerns. Uh, the health department also recommended, I believe I may have left that out in the motion, uh, to establish a baseline uh, to test the wells beforehand, before construction, if they are blasting. Um, they haven't established yet if they have to blast or they do not, but that's something that they would have to obviously comply with if they were uh, to do any blasting. If I could um, help with that, because yes, yes, there was a series of emails that were in response to the, her initial memo, and um, she sent an email out, Vanessa Batista, uh, Director of Health said, um, this email is in response to your email to Kevin Longford, Town Planner. If there is no blasting taking place, then no further actions are required. In this case, it is recommended for homeowners with neighboring wells to test their well now so that they have a baseline prior to any construction. Um, and I think Town Planner is correct that if there is blasting proposed, which at this point we have no plans for blasting, um, that there would be, you know, we would look into the testing to make sure there's um, no problem with the wells. But again, there's no, there's no plan blasting at this point. Thank you, and, and just back to our town planner, and, and I, I apologize because I just wanna make sure I understand everything that, that's being said. Absolutely. This is a standard recommendation if there is blasting is what you're telling me. Correct, that's how the health department conveyed that to me. Yes, um, okay. I don't wanna put words in her mouth, but she was uh, uh, consulting with the applicant back and forth, so. Thank you on that. Um, and the, to, the, to the applicant, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I know you mentioned hours of operation that could be in flux depending on um, who the tenant might be, um, but you anticipate and you know, you're offering a 24-7 type Correct. of operation? Correct, it'd be 24-7 um, being offered. And I'm guessing that um, because of the unknown tenant, it's unknown whether refrigerated or reefers will be present on site um, because you don't know who's gonna be there. That, that's correct, right. but uh, if that gets to like, I know there's, there were some comments in some of the things I saw from the neighborhood about you know, noise. Um, your noise ordinance is pretty clear and any tenant we have has to comply with the no noise ordinance that would be that in their lease. Um, we would require that if we're operating ourselves. So you have protections in place uh, for, that type, for that type of thing. Thank you, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm not on noise yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to traffic and I'm going to um, classification of the, the warehouse because a reefer presupposes um, spoilage of food, which means that their truck generation needs, needs to move faster. And the number of reefer containers that are on site means more trips. It's just a fact because our eggs don't last forever. <laughs> so um, without knowing who the applicant is, and this goes back to Commissioner Cohen and Commissioner Fitzsimmons' comments, we can say right now, and you, and you have said right now, that the use is, is a 150 use, Correct. but if all of a sudden 50% of those spaces needed to be used for reefer type containers, that changes the trips. And we don't know if that's gonna be the case, right? I'd have to say correct. I, we don't know if that's okay. the case. Okay, I just wanna make, I'm, I, I'm not playing any no, games. No, I'm not understand. asking any trick questions. I just wanna make sure that I understand what is before us. So, so I appreciate that. Um, I did notice on the, um, on the rear part of the uh, site plan, there's a lot of spaces which looks like they're, they're set for trailer drops. Um, when the, the plan was put together, how did you determine how many spaces for trailer drops would be necessary? Was that based on the square footage of the building? 
Hi there, uh, Chris Gagnon again for the record. Um, so again, uh, in an attempt to comply with the regulations, um, loading parking spaces are required. Uh, you're allowed to have up to 120% of the um, of the loading docks in terms of trailer parking spaces per your regulation. So we're actually under um, under not under parked. We we are well below the allowable number of trailer parking spaces. And just real quick, um, Pat must be clairvoyant, um, but she has the um, cold storage or reefer uh, reference. Uh, those uh, peak hour trips are actually considerably less than the, the 150. So again, our 150 warehousing in terms of trip generation is, is a more conservative uh, assumption than the cold storage. So the, um, in, in my opinion, the question about whether the tenant is refrigerated or not um, actually doesn't have a negative impact with respect to the number of trips generated. So, so, so the, the, the reason I'm asking about the, the drop spaces is because parking in this zone is, and parking spaces in this zone is a big concern, which is why we've made some changes to our regulations. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to make sure that the application complies with our plan, this is what I'm trying to ask. So I want you to understand why I'm asking, mm -hmm. because um, I'm not just asking so you can hear my voice, I promise you. Um, I mean, on, on both the truck parking and the, and the car parking, it's not the maximum that your regulations would permit on the side. We've tried to be, trying to strike the balance between what an ultimate tenant may need and also not putting more there than is needed in the ultimate design of the project. Right, but it would be fair to say that you're anticipating for what the market might demand of you, but you don't know. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did notice and this was just the most recent uh, traffic overview. It was revised. Um, and it's just, just a question on preparing these documents and everything else. The, the document is signed and sealed by a, um, a Michael Dion, um, who is not the engineer sitting uh, to your left. I understand that. Um, I just want to ask the engineer sitting to your left uh, a couple of questions just to make sure that um, we're, we're looking at the same thing. That is correct. Um, and did you have any input in putting together this traffic overview? I drafted the original study. Mike Dion, uh, who signed and sealed, is my supervisor. Okay. So it's really your I study, your study with Mike's signature. That explains it to me. I thought you wouldn't be a Michael. Uh, <laughs> um, I did have a question on the plan. I noticed to what I'm going to call the right of the plan where the um, residential zone is, you had some significant uh, foliage and, and trees planted. But in what I'm going to call the rear, the back, um, that borders electrical property, and then there's residential kind of up the hill, um, which um, on past applications, the public has mentioned noise concerns coming in that direction. Is there any plan for any noise shielding in the back? It was not anticipated any at, at, that, okay. at that point. I mean, it's, a, it's a fairly long distance, um, and there is a fair amount of foliage between there. Okay, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with, with the area and with the traffic and with the noise that, that comes up there. So um, I'm, I'm just asking to make sure. Um, I do have just a, one quick comment. 
I might be one of the only commissioners that has traveled and regularly travels this more than Commissioner Cohen, um, this area. And I can tell you I have the same concerns about the traffic denigration that's occurred and will likely occur um, here. That two left turn that we have no comment on, I understand engineering wise two tractor trailers can make a left at the same time. Once a week, I see one tractor trailer fail to make that turn. So I'm just concerned. I want to make sure that it is safe for everyone traveling in that area. I want to make sure that this application, if approved, would be safe and meet those guidelines. So I do have that comment, and I understand what you're telling me, but my eyes tell me other things from seeing it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Any other commission members? Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, first of all, I, I have more of a comment um, than I do a question, and I will get uh, to questions. Um, I personally am not happy with our regulations. In my mind, and I'm just going to say it, uh, we revised our regulations. We just went through a, a very long and protracted process. And I spent hours going through the regulations. We had discussions about provisions in our regulations that would have made this very application a special permit, not a site plan. Those provisions in the final version were taken out. And I'm bringing this up because I'm not happy about it. So now here we are. We have a site plan for a 450 thousand square foot building with five, over 500 parking spaces. In my mind, there's no reason this should be a site plan. That's just, that's just my comments. Uh, so I'm, I'm frustrated by the process. I'm frustrated that we're here tonight in this position. Um, people may be upset with me, but I'm frustrated. So let me get to my questions. Um, how tall will this building be? I thought I heard 40 feet, but I'm not. Jeff Checkway with Clear Properties. Uh, the intent is that we have a 40-foot clear building, which would, um, including the pitch of the roof and surrounding elevations, be somewhere. I believe in the. We don't have the building design done. I'll, I'll come straight forward and say that now. It's not something we would typically do until we have uh, site plan approval before we uh, proceed with that. But the intent is that we have a building that's 40-foot clear. It may be around 52 feet high. I know that the regulation dictates it's 40 feet, but in a situation where you're away from the furthest setback, you're allowed to go one foot up at elevation for every two feet additionally you are from the setback. And I believe at the closest point we're 80 feet, six inches or so. So it would give us the ability to go approximately, uh, is it 15 or 15 feet higher than the 40 foot allowed? within that regulation, so we intend to be within that regulation. Okay. So uh, w would it be fair to say that the building would be at least 40 feet high, maybe maybe taller depending on the final version plan? Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I know you have applied um, as a warehouse. Um, I guess uh, one of the questions I do have for Mr. Pagini is when an applicant comes 
with an application and they say we're applying for a warehouse, does your off, do you or anybody in your office review those plans and say, hey, wait a minute, is this really a warehouse or is this something else or are they categorizing this right or is that left up to us? No, we review it and then we review it with the law department and we review it with the town engineer and the water and sewer division. Um, I mean, the speculative nature of what you're getting into, I think, is like, what, what is prohibited is prohibited, what is allowed is allowed. If someone is presenting a warehousing use, that's how we present it. We don't play detective with the applicant, say, oh, are you going to do this or do that? Or, you know, we look at it based on the use that's described in front of us, um, yeah. so. And, and I guess <sighs> my next question is, um, do any of you up here know what the definition of a um, high cube warehouse is under the ITE? I have it on my phone. <laughs> I don't have it here with me. Um, I can look that up, but essentially, it, it essentially it's an, an Amazon warehouse or a Amazon high cube. Uh, warehouse. Um, well, I, it, it, here's the definition that I have because I've, mm -hmm. I've actually gone and had to do Thank some you. of my research, my own research. Um, um, and what I have here is a high cube warehouse is a building that typically has at least 200,000 gross square feet of floor area. This building does, right? We're at 450,000. Mm -hmm. Um, has a ceiling height of 20 feet, uh, 24 feet or more. This building would potentially, will, we, we would be at 40, at least 40 feet. Um, and is used primarily for the storage and or consolidation of manufactured goods prior to their distribution to retail locations or other warehouses. That would be this case here because we can't have parcel sorting, right? Or, uh, or distribution in this zone. So this would have to be going to retail. Anything stored in, in this building would have to be going to retailers, right? So, so essentially, this building that you're proposing um, qualifies. There's one more category that you're missing uh, when describing the hub uh, or high cube parcel hub warehouse. It's also the modes of transportation. Yeah. Just please. For the record, Pat Padlow. You, you can pull the microphone a little bit closer. For the yes, record, Pat Padlow. Um, my apologies. One more item that always the, the, the describes the high cube parcel hub warehouse is also the modes of transportation that are accessible by the warehouse. And right now we're limited to just trucks. Um, when you have high cube parcel hub warehouse, there are other modes in the vicinity of the warehouse, such as aviation or, tr um, or um, tra uh, trains. Sure, no, I, I understand right. that. I understand that there's different categories. This is the general definition of a high cube warehouse. There may be additional definitions for various categories of um, high cube warehouses, but generally speaking, any high cube warehouse. It needs multiple types of modes of transportation be provided in order to function as a high cube, uh, as a uh, hub warehouse. I'm not talking about a high cube hub warehouse. That's a subcategory of high cube warehouse. Okay. A high cube warehouse in general is something, is a warehouse that is 200,000 gross square feet of floor area or more, has a ceiling height of 20 feet, four feet or more, and is used primarily for the storage in or consolidation of manufactured goods. Okay, there are, I understand that there are uh, subcategories, which would include high Q parcel hub warehouse, which is what I think you are speaking of. That is a subcategory. I understand that we are not dealing with that type of warehouse here. 
Are you aware, um, is anybody um, in your group aware of any um, criticism of the ITE manual with respect to high cube warehouses and the trip generation that high cube warehouses produce? Um, for the record, Pa Pablo. Uh, yes, there are some criticism of it. However, whenever um, there are studies of high cube parcel hub warehouses in Connecticut, Connecticut DOT, and if they're located on the state route, Connecticut DOT OSTA office requires, um, usually those, those type of warehouses are for Amazon distribution centers. And um, Connecticut DOT OSTA office requires a different type of trip generation provided by um, the Amazon. Okay. Um, here, here's the reason why I ask. Um, you, you know, in about five minutes' time on Google, I, I came up with a document produced by the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission in Pennsylvania. They oversee uh, 62 communities uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the things that they say about the ITE and high cube warehouses is that there is a relatively small volume of study information av available in the high cube warehouse land use database. The database relies primarily on four areas. While there is a stronger correlation between vehicle trips and building gross square footage in regard to high cube warehousing. Gross building storage square footage is currently not available in the ITE trip generation manuals. The document then goes on to say that the reason why gross square footage is the more accurate measure is because high cube warehousing, generally your traditional warehouse is 24 feet high. In recent times, what is happening is warehousing is getting higher and higher and higher. And so what's happening now and also at the same time becoming more automated. So what's happening is at 40 feet, almost up to 52 feet, it's like stacking one warehouse on top of another. And not only are you stacking one warehouse on top of another, but now you're making, now you're automating it, which is then creating more traffic generation because goods are moving at a much faster pace. And why I think that's important is because, and uh, you know, I, I think y you know, in in the presentation there was a little language that was left out. And what our regulation actually says is uses in the zoning district generating a hundred. Well, there is a uh, requirement for a special permit when the use in the zoning district generating 100 peak hour vehicle trips or more using the standards in the most recent edition of the trip generation ITE or a more accurate source if available. Um, so the question then becomes, is the ITE really the most accurate source? And unbeknownst to me, um, and it's, it's actually an issue that I brought up in prior applications on this property and during our uh, discussions regarding the revisions, was whether the ITE is really kind of outdated at this point uh, because these warehouses are getting larger and more automated and goods are moving at a much faster pace. And I really didn't get a satisfactory answer at the time, I don't think in my mind. And now I, I look at something like this, and clearly there is some 
disagreement as to whether we really should be going on um, uh, the uh, square foot, the floor square footage. Um, and especially when, when I hear that we're actually going to be potentially having a building that is twice the size, twice the height of a traditional warehouse. Um, I have concerns. And I'm not sure that this is actually a building that is going to generate less than 100 peak hour uh, trips uh, per day. Um, the other question I had is, um, there was the, the, some discussion about the parking um, spaces. And my understanding is that there are 530 parking spaces. Correct? Yes. Okay. And those parking spaces, I think there was some discussion as to whether they're really needed or not. And I, if I understood correctly, it was, the answer was, well, we don't know if we're going to need them. We want to have them if we do need them. If we don't need them, then maybe we come back and we ask for a reduction. Is that, I mean, basically. Oh, I was responding to the chairman's question, which was, you know, because of the zone and the water protection um, area, the watershed protection area, this commission is always looking to try to reduce the number of parking spaces, which, which is great. Um, it, because our tenant is speculative at this point, we wanted to provide what we believe will be a sufficient number while staying below what would be the max on this site. If it turned out that we could provide fewer spaces based upon a tenant, if, if you are to approve us and we can get a tenant and we're able to provide less, then we would come back under the provisions of your regulation saying, can we provide fewer of those parking spaces. So there's less disturbance, less runoff. Okay. Uh, and I think when asked, one of the responses was, well, we need that much because of um, personnel shifts. That's, that, a, that's a potential, yes. Right. And uh, you have 530 spaces. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, sh uh, <laughs> you don't know who your tenant is, right? Right. You don't know when those shift changes are going to be, correct? Correct. And you don't know how many people are going to be um, uh, involved in those shifts, correct? Correct. Okay. And that kind of leads me to another, it, another question, which is at, with 530 spaces, there's a potential that each day, depending on who the tenant is, that you're going to have over 100 peak hour trips per day because you don't know when those, you don't know who the tenant is, you don't know when those shifts are going to be, and you've got 530 spaces that you're asking us to, to approve. No, I, I think that it goes back to the use and the square footage for the use because that's what the calculation is based on. So it's not based on the parking. The parking spaces and the square footage, when it's under the state's review, uh, for traffic generators, that's their trigger to look at that necessarily. But it doesn't, they don't look at necessarily, you know, um, uh, number of spaces, you know, beyond the 200, I think. They look at how the traffic cuts are to come out at that point. But I think that the, um, you know, the, the point of the spaces that are there is if we have a tenant that needs them that are there. And I think that the intention would be to come if we don't need them to get a reduction. And then, Mr. Pagini, um, with respect to a site plan application, <coughs> when it gets to um, the point where we're at a hearing and the presentation is being made to us, and there is a requirement um, that a particular application um, or a particular applicant uh, show or demonstrate what the traffic generation will be, uh, who has that burden? Is, is it the applicant's burden to show um, that yes. they fall underneath that 100? Yes, um, they, they have their stamped licensed professional engineer and they put that on the line when they come to a meeting. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I, I see that we do have a memo from the um, from Corporation Council. Um, 
and, and I'm a little kind of, I was kind of a little surprised to see this. Um, generally, we don't get a memo from the uh, Corporation Council unless it's prompted by either us or somebody asked the, the, the Corporation Council for a, me a memo. How was, uh, what initiated? How it was, was this it was requested that she look at the application to determine whether it was special permit or site plan, and then the memo was given to me. Who asked, but who, at, who asked for that opinion? It was prompted by a commission member, I believe, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Okay. Um, he, had, he had asked. Okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and then I, I do have a question I do have a question on um, Attorney Perito. Um, in your supplement to application for site plan dated November 14, 2022, the last paragraph, um, and I, I just want to clarify this, um, the last paragraph suggests that once a zoning, you, you quote the PNZ Road um, case, and you say once a, uh, in, in that um, decision, the quote is, once a zoning authority establishes that a particular use within a zone is permitted, a conclusive presumption arises that such a use in general does not adversely affect the traffic within the zone. Correct. Right. And then the next sentence is, the review of traffic concerns are limited to on-site traffic um, well, we have a um, we have a provision in our regulations that basically says even if this use is permitted, if the use generates over a hundred peak hour trips, it's by special permit. Correct. Are you saying that that provision is illegal? No, it's a special permit. It's not a site plan. No, but you're saying, but the 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 language that you quote here says that when a particular use is permitted, so in this case, we're how, when I read this, the way I read this is when a particular use within a zone is permitted, warehousing, in this case, mm -hmm. warehousing, right? Mm -hmm. A conclusive presumption arises that such a use in general does not adversely affect the traffic within the zone, okay? so. I'm left to think, well, if it's, if it's warehousing and warehousing is permitted, then there's no adverse traffic uh, effect. If, if that particular use is permitted by, special perm by site plan, if it's special permit, it opens up all kinds of areas that you can look at. As you oh, said okay. before, your concern was, you, know, you, you weren't happy when the regulations were changed because you yeah. felt that warehouse should be within special permit. And I understand your concerns about that. Um, yeah. A lot of the questions that we've gotten tonight stem from your own regulation, which you created the box when you changed your regulations, and, and we've tried to follow that as best we can. You raise yeah. questions about the IT. There may be other methodologies. The IT is what's accepted. The IT is what um, uh, Condot uses. The IT is what your engineer looks at. We only can use the tools that both your regulation and sort of the standard is to use. Um, that's really the best we can do. And we've, we've tried to come in with a, a proposal, that, and we know all the history with this property. I haven't been with all the history of this property. You all have. But I know the history with this property because I've, I've looked into it. You know, the site plan parameters, that box that's created, I think we've, we've shown that we fit into that. I mean, if you are not happy with how your regulations sort of created that box, you can change that. And, and maybe you will. But that's what we have. Yeah, uh, but you will agree with me that there is a uh, there is language in our uh, regulations that it would allow us not to use the ITE if we found that there was a more accurate way to de to determine the traffic generation. Correct? I don't know if that language says that it would permit you necessarily. It would permit um, maybe the applicant to come in with that if it was another standard. Um, and I don't know of a standard that is sort of universally accepted by that. You've talked about studies, but it's not, for instance, like you know, DOT puts out regulations that say, 
use, use this manual or this manual, where you'd have a choice, but to my knowledge, they don't. Not for IT chip generation. Uh, Canarica DOT specifically only utilizes IT chip generation. There are some instances where they will require or will ask you to use a different rate if IT chip generation does not provide enough. Excuse me again. Please pull it closer. My apologies. Um, Canarica DOT uses exclusively, exclusively ITE trip generation manual. However, when there are instances where there is no particular land use code to define a particular development, um, um, Canarica DOT will provide you with some guidance what to do or what, to, what kind of numbers to use. Um, I, to, to your point, you've quoted um, Pennsylvania as uh, having other documentation. Uh, it's not a, just Pennsylvania that has that. For example, New Jersey utilizes their own trip generations and rates and percentages and peak hours for a multitude of different types of developments. It's just that within, Canary, within Connecticut, they're utilizing ITE trip generation manual for this particular type of land use. And, and I appreciate that. I just think that there are uh, unbeknownst to me, um, there seems to be some debate, particularly uh, with respect to warehouses and the types of warehouses that are at issue in this particular application as to whether the ITE is in fact the uh, most accurate um, uh, manual or source uh, under these circumstances. And, and I think our, our regulations at least allow us some uh, wiggle room in that respect. I don't think it says that we have to use the ITE if there's a more a if we determine that there's a more accurate source. So I, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hine. Other commission members before I go out to the public. Yes, Mr. Perrin. Um, I just have a few comments that, uh, that I like, like to make, if I may. Yeah, I okay. recognize Okay, you. listening to the two commissioners who have been talking here for a while, and I really, I don't want to say the word is confused, but maybe puzzled or perplexed because we have something in which is a nominally 400,000 square, 400,000 square foot warehouse in which use the IT, the ITE, it works out. But then we raise the question, is it really, is it really a 400,000 square foot warehouse? Yeah, I mean, you build this warehouse on 400,000 square, 400, square feet. But the volume, you know, or the height, it suggests it's really a multi, it's essentially a multi-story warehouse. And it has, and if you had actually solid floors, and you'd be having maybe multiples of that. It could be uh, 400,000, 800,000, or 12,000, uh, or, or, or more uh, of actual, uh, actual floor space. But this is where you have virtual floor space, is that you have the use of that because you're stacking your goods up so high. So, when, and so I'm wondering if the ITE really does apply if there's a different methodology that you have to use when your nominal 400,000 square foot warehouse is actually much larger. And what makes the, when the concerning part is, uh, you know, we, we find we don't know who the tenant's going to be, we don't know what they're going to store, how they're going to, know how they're going to utilize this thing, um, what the hours of operations are, it seems that we don't have a target to shoot at. We don't have a, you know, I, I, I can't say, well, this is what it's going to be when I think everybody agrees we really don't know what it's going to be. And I think there would be, you know, I would have a tough time explaining to somebody else approving this project. So why'd you do this? Well, it's 400,000 square feet. Yeah, but you don't know. Who's there you know, with all these things that, you know, you say you don't know, and we certainly don't know. 
So that it's, it would seem to me that you'd have to, you know, if you, if you wanted to do this or to provide the confidence that a commissioner could, put, could vote on the project, you'd have, to ha you'd have to be far more detailed in your plans. I mean, I know you've, you've done a lot of work, but I think there's uh, much more details required. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would the applicant like to respond to I'm, that? Or? I'm not quite sure how to answer that because, again, you know, we, we designed the project based upon your regulations. And if your regulations said that if you're over a certain height, then you have to count it as X number more square footage for your, for your calculations, that would get to lots of things like, you know, um, floor area ratios and things like that. I mean, it's not a floor. Under your analysis, um, Commissioner Benton, it's but it's a think, you're thinking of it as a as a virtual floor, right? And your your regs don't talk about that. I mean, they could, but they don't. And so it's sort of like a, a what if, um, you know, whether whether a tenant would use all of that square footage up the 40 feet again would depend on their specific needs. I mean, I I got a warehouse um, approved in in New Haven, not as big as this, admittedly but not as, nowhere near as big a site. Um, and two buildings, about 50,000 square feet each, a small parcel, um, all tractor trailers in and out of it. And, you know, there's users, there's people that, you know, they fill up that space and it, they're high. I mean, they go up 40 feet. There's no question about it. Um, so I think that, it's, you know, it's an interesting question, but I think in the context of the regulations, it's not something that really, you know, sort of can be addressed or, or in this. So I, I think we've tried to follow exactly the regulations and to give you all the information that we have that fits the regulations. Thank you. You good, Mr. Parent? Okay. Any other commission members? Okay, at this point in time, we'll go out to the public. Can I have a raise of hands of uh, members of the public who would like to speak, uh, make comments on the application? So I'm going to start with the uh, right side of the, uh, the auditorium, then we're going to move to the left. So again, on the right side, we'll start with this gentleman. Other people that would like to uh, speak on the application from the right side? Sir, I saw you. Okay, you'll be next. You're up, sir. And again, please, your name and address. Yes. Uh, my name is Joe Heron. I live at 206 High Hill Road. I've been a resident of Wallingford for 50 years. And I've been at the 206 resident for, well, I'm gonna say about 42 years. Uh, but I've been at uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission meetings. I think this is the third try uh, for this type of application. And uh, pardon my cynicism, but the first, as, as the, oh, by the way, the bright spot of this whole thing is this commission. And I continue to, to uh, attend these type of hearings. But in any way, uh, the first application, as you know, was for 1.1 million square feet. And I believe the second one application with Amazon was... Uh, less than that, but I can't remember. Uh, so this is the third try, and it seems to me, again, pardon my cynicism, but it seems to me um, this try is really a strategy to bypass a special permit, right? Because my understanding is a special permit is not needed in this case. So what they did, as I think what is apparent is go to a smaller square foot um, area and by doing so, they can later or get it approved because there's no special permit, but at a later time, apply for additional warehouse and you know, you add them up and you're gonna be up to the 1.1 million square feet. Uh, I have attended the, uh, the Inland Wetlands Commission uh, last meeting, and I asked the question, well, why do they want 
an additional 11.8 square foot um, area. And the response to me from a uh, member of the uh, uh, Water Commission is that, well, they want a bigger warehouse. So that just tells me it's a pretty deceitful thing. And you wonder why the public at, at large is cynical of our governments, not, not this committee. Um, but uh, I'm very impressed with uh, Mr. Ch uh, Commissioner, rather, Cohen, and also Fitzsimmons, who was instrumental in, in it seems, getting the first application. On the basis of traffic, it's always traffic. And now it, the discussion um, tonight and, and every other uh, application has been traffic. And, uh, well, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And the gentleman in the back. Good evening, Bob DeMeo, Marie Lane in Wallingford. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Sir, if you could speak up just a little bit louder, maybe bring the microphone yep. a little bit I, closer to you. Bob DeMeo, Marie Lane. I appreciate the opportunity to make a few comments this evening. It sounds like my correspondence was received and folks have read it, which is great. Um, I obviously have concerns about this development, this proposal. I think um, the traffic, the truck traffic in particular is an issue. I think the fact that you guys not to repeat what you guys have discussed very well, um, but not knowing what the true use of this site is going to be is, is, is not fair uh, that you're having to make a call on this. Frankly, if they can't explain what's going in, you don't know what's, who's going in. What you have to go by is the size of the building, the number of parking spots, the number of truck spaces. And all of those add up to much more than 82 trips per hour and certainly not 750 daily trips. I mean, there's 500 cars, 200 truck spaces. They come in and out once a day, you're at 1,400 trips. So this, the math just simply doesn't work. That's, that's what I would say relative to the, um, the 100 trips. And there, is, there are other measures, more accurate measures, to Commissioner Hines' point, well articulated. There's actually something called passenger car equivalents that's used by the Federal Highway Administration. It's used in other countries, and it gives ratings uh, to vehicles. A car is very different than a truck. Uh, a truck could be the equivalent of three or four cars. So while your regulations talk about vehicles, 100 vehicles, unfortunately it isn't specific to say you know, that a truck operates very differently than a car. Maybe that's something in the future that could change. But I know the intent of having 100 is to take care and be careful with traffic uh, and protecting the safety of residents. And if you do the math on, you know, the, what the applicant has presented and you looked at, let's call it passenger car equivalents, you'd be well in excess of 80 uh, trips, peak trips per hour. So, so I wanted to make that point. Two other real quick points. Um, the loading docks, uh, it's been asked before, but your regulations state very clearly loading docks to, to be located inside or rear yards. Um, and if those cider rear yards are visible uh, in a public right-of-way that you can request screening. The entire front of the warehouse is all warehouses. That is the front of the warehouse. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, outside storage. Um, you know, this commission, the public, town staff spent a lot of time working on those watershed interchange district changes, and I don't disagree. It's, they fell short, unfortunately. Um, there was some really good work. We just didn't get it to where it needed to be. But there was, there was some specific language and things put in around outside storage. Outside storage was, was allowed previously in the IX zone. Um, this is now the Watershed Interchange District. It does not allow outside storage. Um, there's 15 other uses in this zone. Warehouses, warehousing happens to be one of them. When we were talking about these new regs, the warehousing that people we were thinking of was food bank warehousing, not Amazon warehousing, with tractor trailers, many stories high, uh, and 500 plus um, parking spots. That is exactly what we were not looking for. In fact, if, if you look at the definition of the, of the zone, 
It says, the purpose is protecting the town's drinking water while allowing low intensity uses. Think food bank, not Amazon. And I will just say, this application is a replica of what was uh, put forth in 2018, one of the two warehouses, virtually exact. At that time, uh, in 2018, the attorney, Mr. Seneviva, was asked about the applicant. They didn't have an applicant then, as you may remember. And what did he say? I'll tell you what he said. He said, at the October 10 meeting, he said, I recognize this looks like a development for an Amazon, Google-type business. And then he said on November 14th, he said, when talking about hours of operation, this is not a, quote unquote, this is not a tenant driven operation. It's based on e-commerce, same building. So I, I think you need to be aware of that. So, you know, I, I will just say um, storage, going back to the storage, your regulations call out storage and define it as Merchandise, supplies, machinery, metal containers, and trailers. They've got spot for 96 trailers that are away from the building that I would say is storing the trailers. If those trailers are loaded with merchandise, then they're, that is also disallowed. So you can't have storage for trailers. You can't have merchandise being stored. So whether they're empty or full, it's not allowed for the, per the watershed interchange district. Um, I guess the last thing I would say relative to that is Mr. Uh, I think it was Mr. Checkaway that came up when you asked about the use um, who are you looking for what type tenant he said well someone that needs a warehouse or quote unquote trailer storage spaces you cannot store trailers in this district we took it out for a reason to protect the watershed thank you I appreciate it Thank you, sir. If we could just, everybody, please hold your applause till the end. I, I'd certainly appreciate that. Now, I, on the uh, left, okay, we'll take this, we'll take the uh, young lady in the back, and then, sir, you'll be next. Joan De Pasquale. My name is Joan De Pasquale. I live on Barnes Road, and my backyard is just a stone's throw from the Calair property. I'm not going to repeat what everybody else has had said tonight. I sent in a correspondence, which I assume all of you gentlemen have read, and I'm just going to say, after listening to the presentation tonight, that Calair is playing cat and mouse with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, sir, yes, you're next. And while he's coming up again, anyone on the right side, is everyone on the right side commented that would like to comment? My name is Robert Keselowski, 117 Thorpe Avenue, Wallingford. Just want you to know, <clears throat> I was in the trucking industry for 40 some odd years. I delivered to CNS warehouses, Amazon, from Connecticut, Western Mass, New Hampshire, and Vermont. I bent them all. That is the same footprint up there as all those buildings. And I never, ever delivered to them without waiting one to two hours to back into that dock. And if you take and go to any of these food warehouses, or any of these warehouses when it's raining out, and go in the back where they're holding the trucks and the trailers, Go look at the water. It's got a slight blue color to it. You know what the water blue is from? Oil. Every truck sitting out there will drip oil. When it rains, now you've got an oil bath. Where's that going? Or they have a certain area in a watershed to put it in a tank to now take that out every so many months and came it out? Because now you're going to bring water with oil into the soil, into the watershed. I know, I've been doing it for 40 years. I've been to many, many food warehouses, Amazons, and everything else. You never can go to these places and back up to that dock. You've got one to two hour wait, no matter when you go, and you've got 40, 50, 60 trucks sitting there waiting to back in. And food warehouses, you've got reefers and everything else running. Thank you. Thank, 
Thank you, sir. Okay, we're going to move now to the uh, more toward the center. We'll uh, start with this young lady in the orange and move on. Hi, Jen Frechette, Valley View Drive. Thank you to everybody sitting up there who's been working so hard for so many years to prevent this. Um, I am too frustrated that the regulation changes did not set us up for better success. <laughs> um, my concerns are the same, 24-7 operation, so many tractor trailer trucks coming and going, all of those noises that are approved by OSHA that we're going to be hearing day and night. We also know, as Bob mentioned, that this is one of the two warehouses they originally proposed. There's nothing from stopping them coming back and proposing the second warehouse. Um, they could also subdivide the property and then we're stuck again. Um, you know, I think everybody knows that this is part phase one of two, whatever that phase two is going to be, we don't know. And it's just, it's really scary. And I hope that you vote no for this. And thank you for your time. Thank you. And again, looking on this right side. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Steve Backless, and I'm also from Valley View Drive. Um, I know initially there was talk about the Class A. Class A, from what I did quick uh, Google search on, says minimum 13 meters, which is 42 feet, and that's just the inside. It doesn't include the outside, the chillers that will be on the roof and everything else. It's going to be um, very noisy. We discussed that a little bit, um, but nobody ever mentioned anything about pollution from all the trucks sitting there idling and doing whatever. It's going to cause a hazard there. Traffic is already congested. Uh, there was a warehouse that's been put in in Meriden on Murdoch Avenue uh, for distribution center. Um, Yale's putting in a cancer thing on Northrop Road as well. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. But the other main thing that I had read on the patch in Wallingford is the state of Connecticut gave Wallingford $487,000 to purchase land on Williams Road to protect the Mackenzie Reservoir, which is fed by the Muddy River, which is adjacent to this property. And whatever, I don't know what they're going to do to prevent that from contaminating it, but it just seems um, anti what the purpose of the grant was to protect the, the reservoir for the town of Wallingford's people. Thank you, sir. Other people on the, uh, yes. <coughs> oh, yes, please. Holly McNabola, 90 High Hill Road. And I just find it very concerning that there was kind of a very quick uh, response to the noise that is produced by that area um, for the folks who are on High Hill Road. Um, it hadn't been thought about, which means um, there hasn't been a lot of thought, in my opinion, given to the residents of High Hill Road. And just another thing that, that you all need to be aware of, um, all the traffic rules and all that is all well and good, but I've been running with my dog on a high hill road and almost got hit by a tractor trailer on high hill road. And that's from the Amazon uh, warehouse that's in Meriden. So if, you know, it's, it's kind of um, illogical to think that somebody who's not from the area might not take a wrong turn, end up on High Hill Road where there's a huge pedestrian community. Dogs, runners, families, and this is what we're setting ourselves up for. So I just ask you to consider that in your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'd like to for 35 Whistletree Road. Thank you for taking all our comments. Um, I have a couple questions and then two comments, uh, three questions. So one thing is I am trying to follow the regulations and I just want to make sure what I find online on the website 
and it has listed April 12th, 22nd, 2022. That is the newest edition, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, one question I couldn't really understand this. Um, there are a lot of specific definitions in Section 410, the watershed inter interchange, but freight terminals and drop yards, as far as I could see, were not defined. So, my question is, what exactly differentiates the warehousing from the freight terminal? Because I think the, the number of parking spaces is the same. Okay. Mr. Pagini, would you please enlighten everyone? Uh, so that was actually a suggestion from Mr. Hine at the workshop. Well, it doesn't matter who the suggestion was. If you could but, please. Yeah, I don't know if he could clarify what he was um, saying there. Uh, and then we specifically defined parcel sorting and retail distribution to pro pro prohibit that use in that zone. Um, so I think we felt at the time at the workshop that I guess excluding freight terminals and drop yards instead of having to define every type of warehouse that could possibly exist. Uh, I believe that's where we ended up during the discussion. Um, I have a memo from Mr. Hine stating this, uh, so I don't know why he wants to blame us now for doing this, but <laughs> I would like a, an explanation. I don't think I ever um, suggested that we get rid of uh, full definitions. I think what my suggestion was, we started off with two definitions for warehousing. And the only difference was um, freight yards and, and or, or drop yards and freight something, and um, freight terminals or, or something. And I think my suggestion was rather than just repeat everything, um, that you just make clear that one is warehousing without freight terminals and the other was warehousing with freight terminals. Um, that's my recollection. I don't recall ever um, suggesting that we get rid of full, def uh, full definitions. Um, and in fact, I, I think it's a problem that we don't have um, definitions of warehousing um, and we don't have uh, definitions of freight yards and, and drop yards. Um, it, it would probably be helpful to have those. Um, although my understanding is that we do, the default is to go to the uh, Webster's uh, Dictionary. So um, yeah, I think we do better. have those definitions, but I do not um, believe that my suggestion was ever to get rid of full definitions. Um, I, I, I think I was trying to clarify that or, or make our definitions a little more efficient um, so that they were clearer for um, people reading them. Well, I recall speaking with you on the phone and, and clarifying. Yeah, that. I think um, we're getting at the discussion between the two gentlemen. The young so, lady had a question, and I'm not I, sure, was your question answered or not? Not quite, I, I, and I didn't mean to blame anyone for having a definition or not. I really just tried to understand what the difference is because fry terminals are not allowed, but from all I hear, the way this is designed and the, the number of trucking sp parking spots and loading bays and parking, it looks very much like a fry terminal. And as long as we don't have a tenant and we don't know the, the use, how can we approve something that might be a freight terminal. That, I think that was where I wanted to get to. Okay. Um, just a few other small items. The Watershed Interchange District, the, the new amendment, um, as far as I could see, is not listed um, in Section 31A, where all the different uses are listed. Um, there seems to be an omission on page 79 after 410D9. Um, that actually refers to 4.10.E, and I couldn't find any 4.10.E at all. Um, and then there's one other small thing, uh, section 618, soil erosion and sediment control. 
still talks about the New Haven County Soil and Water Conservation District. I don't know if that's still a thing or is it a Southern Regional Conservation District? So I, basically wh where I want to go is I've, I feel like the Watershed Interchange District is a great amendment, but as other speakers have said, it's, it's, it has a lot of shortcomings. So I think um, this application, which falls into that district, basically why we did the amendment, or why you did the amendment, um, this application should not be approved tonight unless these issues are fixed. Number two, um, and I was trying to understand why this has not received a special permit. Um, with all that we heard before, the trip generation is a big discussion. Um, um, I'm trying to find the right spot. One second. According to section 6.10, um, there could be a special permit requested for um, excavation and filling. And there is quite a lot of excavation and filling going on on that side. 60 feet excavation on one end, 40, feet retaining 40 foot retaining wall on the other end. That is a lot of excavation and filling. And then according to section 6.11H of street parking and loading facilities, um, warehousing requires, um, oh, l let me make sure one more time that I have the right uh, version of the zoning regulations. So anybody of you has a printed version in front of you? Excuse me, could you please just talk a little slower if you would please? Okay, sure. Does anybody has, have a printed version of the regulations in front of you? Because I was only working sure. from the online. Sure. So is there a page 184? Mr. Pagini, it's... I'm on page 181. Talking about the trip generation table? Yes. Yeah, Allison yep. told us to uh, take that out a long time ago because it's very, very, very outdated. Something we need to look at. So right now it's still in there. Yes. And it still says warehousing uh, generates 1.6 per 1,000 square foot peak hour vehicle trips. I guess, um, Which, but it also says that the most recent ITE manual must be used. So I don't even know really what. Or or a more accurate, but but then the regulation itself lists 1.6 per 1,000 square foot, which with 450,000 square foot would be 720 peak hour trips, or if you take the 10,000 office space off, still way over 700 peak hour trips. Anywhere between the 70 or 80 that the developer proposes and the 700, we don't know what the peak hour trips are. And so I wonder how can you approve something that we don't know? Um, the presentation also mentioned the plan of conservation and development. Um, the plan of conservation and development also asks to reduce impervious cover in the watershed and to, to use um, low impact development, this application does neither. It increases drastically the impervious cover and it also does use minimal, if at all, any kind of low impact development or um, any green infrastructure. It's all centralized in one humongous retention basin if that ever fails, I don't want to see what's going to happen there. Um, and then, to, so that there are a few other things, smaller items. I already mentioned the freight terminal issue. Um, 
the landscaping I heard has been revised, so I'll skip that. But my, in my opinion, this application should not, either not be decided tonight or not be approved tonight. A general comment, um, it has been mentioned before that this warehouse still looks very much like an Amazon warehouse. And I just wanted to bring that up on the table. Amazon itself, and I guess a lot of other online retailers or warehouse companies, is scr scrapping plans and openings of warehouses all throughout the country. 22 facilities totaling almost 25 million square feet of usable space. The company has delayed opening an additional 21 locations, totaling nearly 28 million square feet, according to a um, consulting firm that tracks the Amazon business, excuse me. So you could say, well, that's the developer's problem, not ours. Well, actually, I think it is ours because we would approve an empty shell, hoping it would bring in tax revenue, which we don't know if it ever will. Uh, but what we do know is that both the construction and operation, if it happens, will risk our water. Um, and then to that point, we all know that the weather is not what it used to be, and it's only gonna get worse. Um, according to the Connecticut Climate Assessment Report, major storms will happen up to four times as often in the future. A Yukon professor describes how, quote, a storm the size of which we might expect to see on once every 20 years could happen as much as four times as often by the year 2050. So any major gigantic retention basin, is that still gonna be enough? to protect our water. The, the, re, the reason for the recent amendment was the watershed protection. And I think the way this project is designed does not do it right. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much for taking comments. Good enough, thank you. Again, on this side of the uh, auditorium, anyone else on the right side or your left side of the fall? Okay, moving over. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. My name, my name is Scott Gray. And I live at uh, 14 Oxford Trail in the Spring Lake neighborhood. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity for letting us speak. Um, I don't know, I wrote down a bunch of notes, but I think the first thing that comes to mind is I think we're, what we're looking at is the devil is wearing a new dress. And uh, we've been through this dance before, and I appreciate the work that the council people that you folks have done in listening to the data that's presented and listening to the heartfelt testimony that citizens present. And uh, I believe most importantly, following your conscious. Um, you know, I live on, my wife and I live on Spring Lake, and we hear these stories about how Spring Lake used to be swimmable, and people had the beach, and things like that, and the first version of the devil came along in the, ver in the guise of Bristol Myers, and when that facility was created, it flooded the heck out of the muddy river. It silted up. The silt all ran downstream, and the first basic impoundment was our nice little neighborhood lake, which now has less water than it does silt in most parts of that lake. And our little dock, I've scraped away 18 inches of silt to see like what the substrata was originally. You can't swim in it, you can't walk in it. If you're in a canoe and you tip over, you're in big trouble. The bottom line of the story is when, these, when the acts of mother nature do what they do, you can't go back. There's no going back. We're never going to get that lake back. That lake is gone. So um, that happened because that pro this very same property was developed in an aggressive manner. So nowadays, we're 40 years later, and we have 
better technology and better oversight, but still, why are we tempting with this? This, this project, why are we tempting fate? And this is just on a generic level. I'm also thinking about the levels of pollution that are going to be emanating from this site and the access to and from it. Light pollution, water pollution, air pollution, noise pollution. Um, you know, a tenant that I like to adhere to as a citizen of a community, Wallingford, I'm proud to live in Wallingford. I love Wallingford. I think Wallingford's done a great job protecting the rights and the quality of life in, of our citizens. So we as citizens don't want our quality of life to decline. Why would we want our quality of life to decline? Why would you want your health to decline? At least let's keep it the way it is. We should be striving to make it better. So why do we want to tempt having it go downhill? Uh, trying to get out onto Route 68 from Williams, we have two rush hours a day. Rush hours now are about three hours each. So that's six hours a day. When you're trying to get through that intersection, you're screwed. You could be sitting at that stoplight, that stop sign for, you know, just sitting there for five minutes. We have four on-off ramps right up the road past research on 91. And during those, that six hour rush hour period, morning and night, those things are at their max now. And the little sign I was walking around with before, one truck per 36 seconds, let's just add that and see how nice it gets. How's that going to treat our quality of life? It's going to, people are going to want to move away from there. We attended uh, hearings on this. This is the third round, and I was really astonished that the Inland Wetland Commission approved this. I mean, I was absolutely astonished. They were not looking out for the quality of our streams and our water. That, that was just a farce. And I don't think I really need to say much more about that. Um, and the prior citizen commented on rainfall data. Uh, you know, we have the rainfall data that the studies re were reviewing at the Inland Wetlands Commission hearings were inordinately, they were terrible. It was ironic because I think three days before that last hearing, we had like a seven inch rainfall or something. And that would have overridden the, the uh, retention ponds and the system that they had in place. And that was just three days before that hearing. Um, so soil erosion, sediment control, water runoff, those are big problems, and when that happens, it affects us downstream. And you know, a, a good way to look at things is, we're all downstream. That's how everybody should look at this. Everybody is downstream from this. We don't want it, and we trust, we trust on you guys. We rely on you to, to do what's right for the citizens, of Wallingford, we're first. Not tax base, not corporate interests, not governmental needs, the citizens. We're, we should be the priority. And I believe the consensus of the citizens on this project is a big fat no. Uh, the devil's got a whole new dress. Thank you, sir. Other members, yes, gentleman in the back with the hat. Good evening, uh, Ed Bradley, Chew Hampton Trail. Uh, I didn't have any prepared comments because I was under the impression that since this wasn't a special permit, there would be no public comment. I guess I was wrong. Well, I, Mr. Bradley, I think if you watched all of our meetings, I think you'd know that uh, whether it's a special permit or not, we always give the public the opportunity to comment on, on applications, whether it's a 
obviously a special permit we need to do that, but I think we've had a very long history of site plans. We've allowed people to, uh, to comment, so you don't watch our show enough. <laughs> <laughs> but again, Mr. Bradley, please continue. Yeah, a um, question uh, for the chairman. Uh, if this gets voted on tonight, who are your voting commissioners? It's the five uh, commission members. Who would that be? It would be uh, Mr. Cohan, Mr. Fitzsimmons, uh, Mr. Vinoit, uh, Mr. Allenson, and myself. And Mr. Is it Priest? Is it? Is Mr. he an Parent. alternate? Yes, Mr. Parents an alternate, and Mr. Parent. Hines an alternate. Okay. I got it. I'm going to go back to the inland wetlands meeting. I know you don't deal with that, but. But if you could please, I, I understand you like to do that, but if you could focus more on, on this application. No, I, rather I will, I will. Uh, you know my concerns yes. uh, from there. But at that meeting, only five voted. One of the members only sat there for a couple of those meetings during that special permit public hearing. The other member that came in, though allowed to vote, attended zero. I know they watch the TV. You know, again, Mr. Bradley, that's, for this, th this meeting, that's irrelevant as far as with the, please let me continue, as far as with inland wetlands, the members that were there, the members that were not there, it's quite possible that uh, you know, if a member uh, attended only one meeting and there were multiple uh, meetings, it's quite possible that individual could have reviewed all of the information that was presented, could have reviewed the, uh, you know, the video of that meeting sure. and felt whoever that person may or may not have been, felt that uh, they were uh, fully prepared to uh, vote on that application. So again, what transpired at the Inland Wetlands meeting is, is irrelevant here. Okay. But I will comment in that I find it ironic, I know Mr. Simmons requested it, that the town attorney submitted a letter. And from what I heard, the town attorney, I gotta go back to Inland Wetlands, submitted also a letter to them. In my opinion, the big push behind this is the Economic Development Commission, which doesn't care about the aquifer, the wetlands, or the WPA. I'm sure the mayor is behind it, and now the town attorney is behind it. Something doesn't sit right. As far as water testing, you heard from the health director. Uh, as far as people should get their wells tested for a baseline. That's true. When I talked with the water division, I asked them, where do they test the water coming off that site, coming down the muddy river, and the reply was they test it at the inlet to Mackenzie Reservoir. It's not tested upstream. And again, I believe you are the erosion board or erosion and flood control board. It has all your members listed on it. Am I correct? Say that again, please. You have another board that's oh. the erosion. The aqua, aquifer protection. Aquifer protection, right. But again, I don't know what meetings you do have, but the town continues to ignore the downstream flooding. 
They keep building and building and building up in that area, and they totally ignore downstream. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Any other members from the public who would like to comment on the application? Well, get, there's some other people who would like to comment. And anyone uh, other than this young lady and, and the other young lady would like another bite at the apple? Yes. We'll go to uh, sir. Yeah, we'll take her, then we'll go to, uh, to you next. Hi, I'm Sonia Wolf, uh, Oxford Trail. And um, like the others, I just want to thank you guys so much. I have so much respect. Um, I've also been at the previous meetings, and um, I, I, yeah, I, I can't say enough for all, all the work that's put in, and, um, and I'm grateful. And um, I guess I have a couple of comments. I, you know, um, David Parent said, you know, he's just so, so succinctly kind of, like how can, how can the number of trips be based on like this square footage of the ground when we're talking about vertical space and almost virtual floors? It was just so simple, but I think my head was trying to wrap around it like this just doesn't add up, this doesn't add up, and, and then and that made it add up. Um, I, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, they're trying to get under the 100 so that they don't have to, you know, trip a permit. That's, you know, Ray Charles could see that. Uh, so, uh, you know, here we are. And everyone has talked about the traffic. And even though there's going to be a traffic, you know, it would bring a traffic report, you know, that everyone would have to be approved by the state and all of that. All you have to do is live on that side of town. I remember this in a previous, you know, this, when we came here the last time, the character of the town was brought into, into question. And that was one of, the, one of the conditions, like, to look at when approving or disapproving. Does it change or is it in line with the character of the town? I can say 100% that this is going to change the character of the east side of town. There is just no way around it, no matter what is said. And, you know, the, this amount of increase in traffic, we already are maxed out. We've already said that. We see the tractor trailers stuck on the, the corners, too. How on earth, I mean, you have to be an imbecile to think it's not going to make it worse. And like it was said, and we've said it before, we're not trying to make things minimally worse. We want to make things better in life, you know? We live in Wallingford because we like it. We want it to be better. We don't want it to be gradually going downtown and we're trying to stave it off. So, you know, you can't change it. It's one of those things that, you know, once the horse has left the barn, you know, and then we go back, you know, 10 years from now and say, oh, well, the regulations, you know, they had changed the regulations and that didn't, you know, it wasn't the right thing to do. And meanwhile, we have this, you know, pollution polluter and a, and a mess for someone else to handle. And I guess, you know, I just hope you, you know, I hope you vote no. I give you, I give you a lot of courage and I know you're, I know you're studying it real hard. I know you'll do the right thing. Good enough, thank you. And uh, sir, I believe you're up next. Jerry Lombardo, 18 Oxford Trail. I'm not a scientist, but um, Thinking about this project, a building that's being described, 100 trucks, 500 cars, they must have a tremendous amount of weight. And I only wonder if this added weight will affect the aquifer that's nearby. Um, and to comment on what the lady said, um, I recently had someone come to my house at 18 Oxford Trail, which sits on Spring Lake, and they said, wow, it's amazing. You live out in the country. We never knew there was a lake here. It's beautiful. Well, instead of my saying to friends, well, I live near a beautiful lake, I'd be saying to them, oh, to find me, I live near the depot. You know, we don't want that, really. And like I say, I'm not a scientist, but I only wonder if the tremendous weight added by this project will affect the aquifer that's below it. You know, I don't know if you have the, the answer to that, but it just makes me wonder, you know. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who would like to speak on the application? I'm getting to you, but I want to see if other people... Yes, sir. 
And after this gentleman, anyone else who has not spoken yet, please raise your hand that would like to speak. Hi, I'm uh, Scott McCaffrey from uh, Cliffside Drive. Um, I just to reiterate what's already been said tonight. This is you know the third time we're coming back, and at a uh, and what is being proposed at a minimum is a huge, very big, very busy warehouse that's going to generate, even according to the proposal, you know, 80 uh, truck trips, you know, per hour. That's a you know a ton of traffic, and I just think if anything else was proposed, I mean, I, I certainly am not anti-business, and we have a you know beautiful hotel across the street there, a food distribution center. I just think we would just love to see, you know, come back with something else, just about anything else. I, this is, seems like just about the worst thing that could be proposed. This huge, busy warehouse with trucks going in and out, uh, you know, all hours of the day, generating tons of traffic. So that was just, uh, you know, just my comment. Thank you, sir. And I believe this young lady would like to speak one more time, and this will be the uh, last member of the public. Yes, you. <laughs> um, just so Adelaide Cop for 35 Riffle Tree Road. Thank you for take, giving me a couple more minutes. Just in case I haven't made that clear, I do think this should be a special permit application and trigger a regular traffic um, impact analysis, not just a traffic overview, which, by the way, in, on the last page, the one dated November 2nd, still mentions the IX interchange district. Just, just throwing that out there. Um, but the question I actually wanted to, to put out once I heard the Spring Lake community talk or neighborhood talk, um, I think section 4.12.H asks for a watershed analysis down to the point where the site is only 10% of the watershed. I have not seen such an analysis in the materials that I looked at this morning in the, in, in the town planner's office. And I was wondering if you could still request that or if, if that can be provided. So at least we know how will this uh, project actually affect the people living downstream. Thank you. Mr. Pagini, could you answer that please? Uh, I did speak with the town engineer. Uh, she was out today. Um, but. I had her look at every part of 4.12, but I will have her specifically answer that question. Okay. Good. Okay, with this, I'll bring it back to the, uh, certainly back to the applicant. Uh, certainly you've heard comments from the uh, public, uh, obviously comments from the commission, and I'm sure you would like to make some additional comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I would. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna address um, all the, points raised by the public. Um, they they um, have every right to express their opinions. Um, it's it's really nice that this commission allows public comment and site plan. You're one of probably the few that, that do that. Um, I think there's a big distinction between the prior applications. The first one was for a million square feet, over twice what this application is. The Amazon application, which was, you know, they came in as a potential buyer of the site, um, and they came in for the, you know, over 500, I think it was, for, for that. Um, they clearly triggered the, uh, uh, the special permit, and that's, and that's a different review. And there's a lot of things that have to come into that review, as you know, from that. When your regulations changed and you set a threshold for these types of warehouses that would be treated as a site plan, it is a different review. There's a couple things that a couple of commissioners raised that I did want to address for you, though. Um, the question about the fire marshal. Now, the fire marshal looks at the plan at this point as a site plan to determine if there's proper access for, you know, police and fire vehicles. There was a question raised about, like, you know, the building height. When building plans are submitted for a, um, uh, a building permit, clearly the fire marshal's department is going to look at, do those plans comply with the state building code? Um, if there's special things that have to be put in place because of the height to deal with fire issues, that's, that's in the code and that would have to obviously be incorporated um, when they're at, you know, at that point. So I think that that, you know, it's, it's a legitimate concern. Um, fire is always a concern in any building and, uh, but that's addressed when you come in for a building permit. Um, I, I think also one of the things, um, there was some criticism of the, of the Wetlands Commission and I have to say, I mean, I wasn't the lead attorney on that, but I was watching a lot of what went on. 
And I think they really did a very complete review. I know that um, the environmental <coughs> consultant planner of the town gets into great detail. I know that, that the uh, town planner was part of the town engineer as well. Um, there was a lot of review, and the focus really was to try to ensure, and in fact, I think we've, we've succeeded in the design to make sure that all the existing wetlands and water caches are protected, or we're staying out of them, and that the whole stormwater system that's put in place is designed to ameliorate the effects of vehicles coming in and out of the site, because that's the biggest thing. One of the things also that um, the watershed protection, watershed protection area district talks about is wanting larger roofs and smaller parking areas, because with a roof, one, you know, you're just collecting rainwater, and that rainwater gets collected and can be infiltrated into the ground. So you're, you know, you're protecting that water source. A roof on this size structure does that. Um, so I think that's, that was important uh, in, in the review, not just for the wetlands and water courses and the water quality, but also in trying to comply with the, the watershed protection area. So I think that, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about other standards for, for traffic. The only standard that you know, is clearly enunciated in the regulations and is in fact accepted by CONDOT, which ultimately has to deal with off-site, um, is the ITE, and, and that's what we've looked at. So I think that's, that's really the, the, um, the reg that we have to go with, the standard we have to go with. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily make everybody happy, um, but I only can go with what's, what's available. Also, in your record, you don't have, you know, any other report or any other, um, position from town staff or anyone else that says, you know, this standard was used and this is what occurred. So I think that's important when you're doing your review. Uh, I think we've, we've gone through an exhaustive review um, through wetlands. We've gone through a lot of um, work with staff, which is exactly what you do on a site plan uh, to make sure that everything detailed is, is, is nailed down. And uh, we've tried to answer all your questions. I know the issue of you know, not having an actual tenant name. I mean, there's lots of um, developments that go on, I mean, historically that, for instance, retail developments that come in, they don't necessarily say who they have um, coming in. They don't know what they'll have yet. And, you know, they're not subject to a um, sort of an inquiry as to, you know, who's the tenant going to be. We say, okay, what's your square footage? Plug it into the ITE. What's going to be your trip generation? You know, retail, depending on what you have, or a doctor's office, you know, a small doctor's office in the center of town, in theory, can generate a lot of traffic. Although now, who knows, with, uh, you know, virtu virtual, um, you know, uh, doctor's visits, maybe they don't anymore. So, I mean, this is something that is evolving. And I think that, you know, we've come in with a project that complies with your regulations. We would ask that you approve it. As I said before, we'd gone through the, the conditions from uh, the town planner. We, we felt all those were completely reasonable and doable. We can do all those. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, sir. I guess I'd go back to the, uh, the commission to see how we would uh, like to proceed with the application. Any comments? Gentlemen? Mr. Simmons? I was Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm never at a loss for words. Um, this has been, it's 1035. I, I, I asked, you know, about the timing because I wasn't sure if, if we had time. Th this is a lot to digest. This is the first time for me that these applic this applicant is in front of us. Um, I, I, just one person I would like to um, continue t and to vote in December. Is my personal. I just have some things I'd like to review further. But uh, this is there's a lot of information presented. I defer to the majority, but my preference would be to continue to December. So let, let me ask you this, Mr. Fitzsimmons, and, and other, no, but other, other commission members, is there any additional information? I know you'd, you'd certainly like to review the information. I suspect probably most commission members would like to absorb what was you know, discussed here this evening. Is there anything else or any additional information that you'd like from, I guess, from the applicant perhaps, from the staff? Any clarification on uh, on issues? And again, it's not just you; it's yeah. commission members. Yeah, the very fair. I, I guess I, I guess in reference to some of the issues that were raised by the commission and by the public, I would appreciate the 
applicant reviewing and deciding if they prefer if they could provide some comments. I realize some of it is, um, you know, the issue of special permit site plan, but I think, like for example, there was some issues raised that I just I I would like the applicant to take time to clarify, um, you know, at, at, at the next meeting. Personally, I, I and I, I'm thinking of one issue might be related to. Um, like I asked about the building orientation, others have talked about the loading docks. Our site plan doesn't re site plan requirements don't don't site plan doesn't require it, but I'd like to see an architectural. That's a request, not a requirement. That's an example of something I would like to see in relation to issues that were raised. So just one example for me. Other commission members, any comments, Mr. Cohan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, me personally, I'm ready to act on this tonight. Um, I do have, uh, you know, a lot more comments, a uh, little different than, you know, what has been expressed by, you know, some of the commissioners and, and some of the public. Um, so for me, you know, I can either, if we're going to continue this, I can save these comments for next meeting. Um, again, I'm, I'm ready to act on this. Um, I, I could talk to these requirements now and let the applicant know what I'm thinking, but I don't think it's going to, uh, you know, change things. They may have time to, you know, argue my argument about, you know, whether this fits into uh, uh, our regulations, but I'm, I'm happy to do that now. Um, there are several comments that if we do act on this tonight um, from the uh, Scott Shipman senior engineer that, <clears throat> you know, Mr. Pagini uh, said to, you know, make these conditions of approval. I think there's uh, some significant items in there that probably should be discussed here, but I, I won't get into that right now. Um, the one item that uh, Mr. DeMeo brought up, which uh, I was not aware of, and I'm, I'm glad he did and would like some clarification on this, was the, I believe it was 96, uh, storage trailers um, you know I was under the impression that uh, you know that was just temporary parking while um, you know goods were moved but it, it sounds like it, it, it could be you know a permanent storage uh, area so I'd kind of like some qualification on that because as he mentioned that is uh, in our regulations that that's not uh, supported. So I can talk about my other well, why not us. Um, I, I think let's start with it. Just you had some questions on the storage. Again, that was Mr. DeMeo's uh, yeah, comments, his impression. These gentlemen may have something totally different. So if you'd like to uh, address that. Or yeah, I think, I think Jeff could address that. Yeah, Jeff Checkaway with Calair Properties. Um, we don't have any intention to have a permanent outdoor storage with any of the tenant use. Well, basically, you get you have those ninety six spots. You know how how long are perhaps you should explain. Is just there exactly a specific what those spots are for. thing in the reg Is there a specific notation in the regulation that states how long something can be there? I don't recall reading that. As I read it, the, this is Chris Gagnon again. The regulations just state no no outside storage. So right. it's a question of is a trailer itself outside storage or is storing something in a trailer, is then that trailer now inside or outside? It is yeah, that's, that's the well, question. Circular. Well, I, I guess maybe the simple question is you have those spots. What's the intention? Well, I'm sure you're not going to you won't be able to answer because you don't have a tenant. <laughs> So it's a little, I, I can understand people's frustration with that because uh, uh, normally, you know, you would say this is what it's going to be used for. 
and right now, candidly, have no idea what it's going to be used for. Is that fair to say? I don't think it is. Yes. I, I can make comments toward what other warehouse users have done, but I don't know that you want to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's just, that would just be speculation. Right. Well, before Mr. Cohen, you have some additional comments. Let's, let me ask other commission members how they'd like to proceed, sure. and that yep. may... Yep. Other members, how would you like to proceed? It's not sugar, it's shrug our shoulders here. I have a coin if you'd like me to flip it. I, I, I'm, I'm good with a coin flip, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I Honestly, I don't know that any additional information will change my readiness. I think that having more time to review the application of the materials would be helpful. But that being said, I don't know that it would change anything either. So I could really go either way, and I'm sorry I'm not very helpful with that decision. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Chairman, before you go to JP, sure. um, you know, with, with respect to Mr. Fitzsimmons' uh, seniority, I, I, I will um, change my opinion and say I'll, I'll wait till next month. <coughs> I, I, I appreciate All right, this. I, I appreciate <laughs> All right, I'll make it easy. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll no, take good. you off the hook. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> See how you don't want to flip a coin either. I think at this particular point in time, I think the commission would like a little bit more time to look at this. I would like, and it may be totally irrelevant, but you know, we it mentioned, and I think it's something I'd like you to look at, Mr. Pagini, as, as well as talk to our uh, our, in, our, uh, our our engineer. And it, it comes back to the, you know, a more accurate source if available. And I'd like at least that to be, you know, that to be looked at and considered and to evaluate, you know, it's on page 74, to evaluate that, to come up with, to see if, uh, and you may have an answer already, but I do. I'd like you to, you know, talk to that with our engineer. And then the other thing that is, is kind of troubling, and I fully understand what, and perhaps someone could even make the argument, when we talk about uh, using, uh, you know, another source, uh, it's somewhat embarrassing, but when we look at, and I forget the page that the uh, young lady had mentioned, uh, where it talks about our uh, 184, I can hear. Uh, <laughs> you know, when it, when it talks about that, uh, as far as what the, uh, yes. you know, wh what the, uh, the number is as far as uh, for the, uh, you know, yep. for the trip generation. Again, I, I understand what the applicant's saying. I understand all of that, but, you know, our regulations say another source, and I'm looking at our book, and it has another source. Now, that may or may not be relevant, but I'd like someone to look at that and come back with, uh, you know, a, uh, an opinion on that or an explanation on that, because that, I mean, it's, to me, it's an issue. It's, it's in our regulations, and yep. we say alternate source or another source. Whether that makes sense or not, I have no clue. That's why I'd like some guidance on that. So with this gentleman, I, again, I'll give you the opportunity to make any, well, first we need your consent to, uh, I, <laughs> to I've continue. I've consulted with Jeff. Sorry, like to first, but yeah, sorry to, you can finish. I, Excuse me? If you want to finish, that's fine. I, I think we kind of stepped on what you're, what you're Oh, no, about. I just, I, I think just, first I just, I, I take it you folks would be, uh, you would consent to continuing this. Is this correct? To our next meeting? Yes, I was, I was hoping to make a few more comments. If this oh, no, we'll, no, we'll, no, I'll let you do that. I just wanted to just get that, and I'll let you gentlemen have an opportunity right. uh, to you make any final comments until we take a motion to continue this. Okay. Yes, yes I, I would agree to extension. To the next meeting. Yeah, to the, the next. The most we can give you, I think. Yeah, is exactly. I, I right. fully understand right. that. Now that we're over that hump, right. would you gentlemen okay. like before we continue this? Would you gentlemen like to make any I think, final I think, comments? I think Jeff Carroy would like to make. Yep. A First off, I'd like to try to understand additional comments that haven't been made. Um, I, I don't want to put ourselves into a situation next hearing. Sorry, next meeting that there's a question that needs answering that we can't come up with. So I think it would be fair if we were to 
you know, if we're granting an extension to understand what those additional comments are if possible, so we can do our level best to address those concerns in the next 30 days or less and, and to work with uh, town staff to, to meet those requirements. Um, and, and in general, I just had a, f a few more comments on this evening's proceedings and, and some questions that I had, I think, but you know, we've, I've been before with Calair Properties uh, going back two applications ago for this site and we were looking for two warehouses speculatively. Um, we did not have a tenant at the time. Uh, whether or not people believed us or not, that's, that's the truth. Um, then we had an agreement with Amazon who pursued their own permits, um, to which was a special permit and, and, and obviously denied. So as the applicant and part of the ownership group of this property, we're looking to come in with something we can get approved. I think we got the message that a special permit will not get approved for this property, so we've shifted our strategy or plan to something that's within the regulations for site plan approval. We didn't come in here with a, a 500 plus thousand square foot warehouse that generated 99 trips per peak, per peak hour. We did it where we're at, I believe 80, whatever the number is, we were leaving room, not for interpretation, but for knowing that IT is the only thing that, that we have here and that we're not trying to cram the biggest possible thing on this site. And quite frankly, it's, it's frustrating that everyone's looking for what seems to be looking for some other thing where they can say that our trip generation is over 100. Um, that wasn't the intent of this project. Like I said, we could have done something bigger, but we left a, is it 25% or 20% room for leeway, um, partially because we don't have a tenant. I will say that over pro past projects that I've developed over the last anywhere from one to eight, 10 years, I've never had a user that generated more than the ITE data. It, you know, in fact, we've always had less. We've always constructed less loading docks than were proposed. Um, we've had less, you know, trip generation. I know that we still don't have a tenant and I know that's problematic, but we can't really do anything about that now. Um, what I will say is that the level of approval in order to bring a tenant to this town is that we get the site plan approval, we go to the building permit, uh, building commissioner, building department to get a building permit, and we can construct this speculative building with no occupant. At some point, we're going to need a certificate of occupancy for this tenant. And in order to do that, we're gonna to have to meet every single requirement in the zone, in the building code. So this isn't a trick to get somebody else here. This is just us going through the steps that we can because we don't have a tenant. Now at some point, there, there's gonna be a review by the fire department, the building department. There's, we'll know, in order to get occupancy, we're gonna to have to know who the tenant is. And at that point, the, through the building permit and occupancy review. I believe it goes to the planning department, it goes through all the other uh, departments in town to get a blessing or a check mark. And we can't put a tenant in here that doesn't meet the regulations. And that's never been our intent, nor will it be, but that's the process by which we plan to proceed with providing a tenant in this building that we feel meets every regulation in the bylaw today, and that's why we're here for site plan approval. We're Thank you, sir. I guess in fairness to you, are there commission members or the applicant that would like to see other information or something else, you know, the applicant uh, to provide? And yes, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Through, through you, Mr. Chairman, in light of the, the last comments made by the speaker, um, I, there's not much I, I disagree with. However, um, as I mentioned during my comments um, some time ago, we don't have the benefit. It's a site plan. And so the, the, the process for the town staff, Mr. Panini, is to route through the town departments. I would request between tonight's meeting and next week's, next month's meeting that you refer the site, in, the traffic information that's been submitted and responded to, to Wallingford's Legal Traffic Authority 
which is the police department, for written comments in advance of the December meeting. It's still a site plan, but here in the comments, I mean, we have to go through all the town departments. So I know if it was, if it was not a special permit, so I'm not going there. As a site plan, we are entitled to request comments from town departments, and we don't have anything from Wallingford's legal traffic, legal traffic authority. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And one of the things I would like to see is, you know, this, this warehouse went from 40 feet to 55 feet uh, in the blink of an eye. Um, and again, one of the requirements in our regulations is safety. So I would like to see, and again, this, this is a um, very tall warehouse, and I'd, I'd like to see the fire marshal weigh in with the specs that we have right now, meaning uh, that 55 foot um, height in the ceiling, whether or not the fire department can handle that. And, you know, based on, you know, potential automation equipment inside. Um, and again, I'm going to refer you to another document have several documents. Um, it's the warehouse capital of the world, New Jersey. It's the New Jersey State Planning Commission Distribution Warehouse and Goods Movement Guidelines. It's dated September 7th, 2022. And it talks about safety on pages 11 and 12. Um, so basically, I'd like to see our fire marshal uh, comment on you know, what's proposed and what New Jersey um, brings up in, on those couple of pages. Any, anyone else? Again, any final comments or uh, gentlemen, uh, you have your assignment and, you. uh, as you, we Mr. have ours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll see you next month. See you next month. For your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Mr. Pacini, as always, take the wheel. Uh, so, um, bond releases and reductions. Um, number six, uh, that was for Roland Technologies. Uh, the site was fully stabilized um, and that bond can be fully released. Um, Apologize. Um, <laughs> Which ones? Which Mr. Pacini, one? you're recommending the is it the Roland Technology Bond? Is that uh, correct? Correct. Yes, I believe you have to vote on it to release it. So I would uh, I would suggest full release of that bond. So we have a motion uh, to release the bond as recommended by our town planner. So moved. I have a second? second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions. <clears throat> And same for number seven, uh, that site was, um, I went out there and checked that out and everything was uh, fully compliant with the site plan. So that can be fully released as well. And I'd entertain a motion on that. So moved. Second. Se second by Mr. Fitzsimmons, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Any, one against it? Moving on. Uh, the. 521 Tully's Road, that was a special permit for a uh, soil remediation project. Uh, that site was fully stabilized, and I was quite impressed with uh, the job that they did. Um, so that could be fully released as well. And again, we entertain a motion on that. So moved. Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Moving on. I believe I do have the PZC meetings. Schedule. Um, I do have it in the cart. I believe I, we didn't make a uh, copy of it. Is it in the packet? Um, Sandy did give me the the one for signature, um, so I can 
hand that up to you if sure. you don't have it. Excuse me. I don't think I don't believe we, we, do we, vote on it, do we right? need to vote. I don't believe we need to vote on this, do we? And I noticed very graciously you uh, did not include uh, Valentine's Day for Mr. Fitzsimmons. I always had to I'm old softy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, moving on. Uh, administrative approvals, any questions on those? Anyone, any questions on the uh, administrative approvals? I suspect not because we've approved them. And bring us um, down. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, could, I, could I make a comment on the administrative approvals? Sure. Um, you know, we we got um, one in the mail. I, I don't know if the deadline has uh, passed, but it was for Delta Arsenal, I believe. Yep. Yep. And making ammunition. Yes. Um, uh, I could have give a background on that kind of. Um, so the original approval specifically asked for manufacturing, but then it wasn't clearly stated on the approval if it was allowed or not. I brought it up to Corporation Council. Um, and so she couldn't decipher whether or not it was actually allowed back in 1996 as part of that approval. They claimed that it was. Um, so there was sort of a back and forth. So we wanted them as part of their ATF renewal to true it up uh, as part of the administrative approval. So if you do have questions as a commission, I would suggest that you know you do bring them to a meeting if there are further questions on that. Um, is it too late to request that? I, really, the only question I have is, you know, the, is is there any safety concerns that you know? we or anybody else in the building need to be you know aware of that's what really flagged my interest in it um and i went out with the fire marshal we did a full inspection of the property uh, he looked for anything that could potentially be a safety concern um, and as part of that process that's where we decided to do the administrative approval just to shore it up to make sure that there weren't any safety concerns from his aspect um, so he did go and do a full fire inspection on the property that will be part of the administrative approval. Uh, if that helps, you can call him yourself or have him explain uh, all of their uh, their ammunition. But yeah, it definitely was a concern from my end, uh, from the zoning enforcement officer's end, and as well as the fire marshal's end. I guess if you know he's okay, I you know I think we need to see it. But thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions on administrative approvals? Uh, the ZBA decisions. Any questions on ZBA decisions, or if none, on the uh, on the agenda? And then the ZBA, um, the current meeting coming up on uh, November twenty first. Any? Questions on that? I'll try my best to um, hopefully answer anything that you may have. No questions. Okay. All right. Is this <laughs> All right. Oh, I think this was uh, this was attached for uh, additional use. Center, correct. Yes. Excuse me for additional uses or something. Yes. I mean, it, I, I think it tracks to sure, Mr. Food trucks. Yeah, food trucks and having <laughs> having that as perhaps a permitted use and putting them in a, a, a courtyard or something along that nature, oh. correct? Yeah, it was supposed to be for the uh, town center discussion. Yeah, for the town center discussion. It was actually brought up to me by several developers, so I thought I'd do kind of a uh, soft sell to the commission <laughs> regarding that. But it's, it's, it's a long shot, I told him, but... I said I'd, I'd try, but in any case, we could discuss that at a later time. <laughs> okay. I guess that brings us to the end of our uh, agenda. If there's no other comments, I'd entertain uh, a motion. Miss, sorry to prolong this. Uh, there's no uh, zoning enforcement lag this month. Uh, you know, I think last month we asked if we could get an update on how the you know project was going. So I came to an administrative office decision 
and if you want to discuss it personally with me, that's fine. I'd rather not discuss it publicly, um, but that we decided to do a quarterly report and any questions you have monthly can be directed to the zoning enforcement officer. She has no problems answering any questions you have. Um, and I will leave it at that for a public forum. I, you are definitely welcome to call me and we can discuss the subsequent well, with, reasoning. Without having the report in front of me, I, I don't know what, you know. Well, we, 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 she will be doing a quarterly report, which will be much more in depth. Uh, that's what we decided on as, a, as an office. All righty then. So at this point in time, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we adjourn the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of November 14th. Second. Is that uh, 2022? 2022. Thank you. <laughs> now we have a second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. All in favor? Aye. aye, aye opposed? Aye. Abstentions? We're adjourned. Have a good day.